Education Committee. Agenda item one is apologies. Is anyone aware of any apologies? No, Chair. No, okay, thank you. Item two is chairperson's business. 2.1 is a press release from the Department of Education dated the 10th of June, where previous Education Minister Peter Weir announced actions to support school leaders. Can I refer members to the Department of Education news release in table papers and ask if members are content to note? Agreed? Okay. Agenda item 2.2 is post-primary transfer. Can I refer members to correspondence forwarded by Nicola Brogan, MLA, on post-primary transfer in table papers? And advise uh, members while this is an individual case, um, there is obviously uh, an urgent and serious wider issue um, that, that has developed um, over a year um, in relation to post-primary places. Um, the Education Authority uh, has obviously set up a, a, a help desk, um, <clears throat> although this is clearly an extremely serious matter. Um, you, you will be well aware that the Education Committee wrote to every school that normally uses academic criteria for admissions in May 2020. Um, the responses we received ranged from being question as to why we were writing to the school, um, um, it's advising us that the usual special circumstances processes would be used to address any issues, which clearly is not going to be adequate to address the issues that are faced. Um, can I suggest that the committee writes to the department to ask um, what measures are being put in place uh, in order to address the matter? Um, whether there will be any other temporary variations. My understanding is there have been 800 temporary variations already this year, um, with some schools seeing as many as an additional 30 places, which is obviously effectively an additional class. Um, what measures and resources are being provided to the Education Authority to ensure that they're able to respond to uh, inquiries and appeals? Um, how the department is seeking to ensure that children will be placed as a matter of urgency. What action the department took when the committee proposed contingency measures um, back in August and again via an uh, assembly supported motion in November 2020. And what uh, reflection the department has on the criteria it permitted uh, uh, schools to use this year and indeed whether it will put in place contingency criteria should tests not be possible next year. Members content with that action or any comments to add to that? Yes, sure. I'm just, I'm just a little bit concerned about the well-being of, of children and families who are experiencing huge uh, duress and stress over this issue especially those families who are on place and those kids who have their life hopes on going to a certain school and uh, or a second choice and haven't been getting their first choice or second choice or even further down the list. I'm really concerned about their mental wellbeing. And is there any counselling provision for those families? If we can add that, that's a, a constructive suggestion to add to our correspondence, Justin. Um, I think it's quite clear that Children and families have been left distraught as a result of the process. Uh, the process leaves children and families distraught every year, um, but particularly this year due to these particular set of circumstances. So I certainly would agree to the addition of that request in the correspondence, Justin. Members content. Okay. Um, obviously, the uh, Deputy Chair and I met with the Education Minister for a very short time yesterday and we, we raised all these matters in relation to the post-primary transfer um, issues with, with her. Okay, 
agenda item 2.3 then members is uh, the meeting with the education minister can i advise members that the deputy chair and i met with the education minister yesterday for a very short period of time um as to to welcome her to her post and to very briefly set out what the education committee considered priority issues in education a note of the meeting is tabled um, we also suggested that we would send the education minister uh, a short one-page paper in relation to um, the education committee's identification of priorities for education um, and we asked that she would meet with the education committee um, at her earliest opportunity i'll not go through all the issues members but you can imagine that the, the issues that we did set out um early um appointment of the independent review of education panel uh the ongoing um chaos in the gtc and i restraint and seclusion flexible school start age emotional health and well-being framework special educational needs provisions area planning post-primary transfer as i've referred to physical education child care strategy rse and we would also wish to include reference to ongoing serious concerns in relation to decisions made by the previous minister in relation to um, the assessment of languages um, in uh, this assessment period. Um, if members have other issues, and I'm sure they will do, um, I would encourage you to forward them to the clerk for inclusion of um, in, in our paper. Um, the, the minister. The minister engaged positively with the deputy chair and i but it, um we we impressed the the urgency of some of these issues on the education minister and i i, I think it's safe to say and I'll, I'll invite the deputy chair to uh, comment as well i think it's safe to say that we will need to continue to impress the urgency of some of these issues on the education minister given um some of the time scales that were um, conveyed to us in, in relation to some of those. Deputy Chair, do you want to comment on that briefly? Yeah, Chair, thanks. Well, we're on a very tight time scale, as you know. Uh, the, the Minister is effectively about nine months left in the mandate. Uh, that's, a, that's if we even get past next week. However, uh, you know, these are pressing issues that need dealt with uh, as a matter of urgency. And I think it's important that, uh, you know, there, there, there has been a lot of consensus in the committee around those issues that you have outlined. And, and I think we need to uh, relay that sense of urgency and consensus in the committee to the new minister. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. I agree. Members content um, with that approach in relation to priority issues um, and the education minister content to uh, agree that action agree okay okay thank you members then agenda item three is draft minutes can i refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 9th of june 2021 at page six of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings agreed agreed thank you Okay, there are no matters arising, members. And agenda item five then is our session on the special educational needs framework with uh, the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People and the Children's Law Centre. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the Children's Commissioner? at page 17, a briefing paper from the Children's Law Centre at page 22. The Children's Law Centre responds to the consultation on the draft SEND regulations at page 34. The Children's Law Centre responds to the consultation on draft SEND code of practice at page 59. Uh, Children with Disabilities Strategic Alliance responds to the consultation on the draft SEND regulations and code at page 83. And the Northern Ireland Assembly Research and Information Service briefing paper on the SEND framework at page 97. Uh, very warm welcome uh, to Kuli Yasuma, the Children's Commissioner for Northern Ireland, Maria McCafferty, the Chief Executive uh, at the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People's Office, 
Rachel Hogan, Special Education and Needs Representative at the Children's Law Centre. Folks, I, I know all of you very, very well um, in my role as an MLA and chair of the Education Committee. Um, and I'm delighted that we're able to welcome you here to the Education Committee this morning, um, given the extremely important work that uh, you have been doing and continue to do on this priority issue of, of special educational needs provision. Um, there are, you may have heard me refer to a, a wide range of other issues that the Education Committee is working on. I imagine you could both uh, be talking about a number of those issues at length t uh, today as well. If you, if you wish to make a comment in relation to any of them, maybe post-primary transfer, I'll, I'll give you grace to, to do so, but it um, might be worth me um, prefacing this by anyone who thinks that you haven't spoken on the wide range of issues that are available, that, that the format today doesn't really give you a great deal of time to be able to do that. Um, and that no one should take from the meeting today that they are not priority issues for you either. But having said that, folks, delighted to welcome you. Um, I try to give you um, as much time as possible in the opening statements, usually around 10 minutes and be delighted to facilitate questions from the members on these important issues thereafter. Um, can I uh, hand over then to uh, Kula, Children's Commissioner for Northern Ireland? Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, you're absolutely right. It's already been an incredibly busy week um, with regards to education. Um, and whilst we have been busy, as it was already mentioned by the committee, children and families um, have been left devastated and very worried about what's ahead. And, and, and it's the not knowing, I think, that is as much of a challenge as the knowing. But um, yes, uh, but we're here um, s to speak about the special educational needs framework, something that is incredibly complex. And I know Mairead and, and I and Rachel will we'll do everything we can to answer your questions. But just by way of introduction, just have a, a, a few comments. And, and again, um, I want to thank the committee for inviting us. Um, we were here two months ago to talk about other issues, and, and I'm pleased to be here again to talk, to, to talk about this. So in the, in the last few years, the whole system has come to accept what parents, children, and others have known for quite a long time, that the right of every child with a special educational need or, dis or a disability to receive appropriate, effective and timely support to engage with education has been sorely lacking in Northern Ireland. There is irrefutable evidence for the need for systemic reform to ensure the needs of children with SCN are met in both mainstream and special school settings. This includes our own review, Too Little Too Late, which looked at provision in mainstream schools and highlighted barriers in the system, preventing children and young people reaching their full potential. There are persistent delays in accessing specialist support, uh, supports at all stages of the SEM process. There are significant inconsistencies across the region accessing specialist provision in mainstream school and poor quantity and quality of supports and services for children with SEM. Other recent reviews have added to this overwhelming evidence base. Um, and the need for systemic change. And these includes from the Public Accounts Committee, from the Northern Ireland Office, uh, from the Northern Ireland Audit Office, um, EA's own improvement plan, and the DE Centre Learner Journey. And of course, um, the many discussions and, 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 and conversations that you have had at this committee. We're here specifically to talk about the developments with the Special Educational Needs and Disability Act of 2016 and the provisions, uh, uh, provisions within it and the release of the revised draft regulations and code of practice, albeit um, delayed, but very welcome that, the, that we're finally moving on them. I am encouraged that some progress has been made in commencing the implementation of the SEM framework, but still have a number of concerns about the content which need to be addressed to facilitate systemic improvements required. And I will, I will um, outline some of the concerns and, and, and I know Rachel CSC and the NGO sector ha have a range of other concerns as well. So um, as I've said, a number, uh, along with a number of others in, in the children's sector, Nikki has made comprehensive submissions to the Department in, of Education in response to the consultation on the regulations and the code of practice or the SEM framework as they're known. These papers framed the key issues in the context of the UNCRC and the findings of too little, too late. 
And importantly, our submissions identified issues beyond the, those set out um, in, the, in the department's free consultation and consultation on the draft regulations and code of practice. Some of the issues have, uh, that, that we have highlighted have been that the proposed revisions are not sufficient in reducing the time frame to complete a statutory assessment and issue a statement. Again and again and again, delay and the time children have to wait to get the services that they need have, have been too long. So the new 22 week window will only apply if there are no valid exceptions. Where there are notified and recorded valid, valid exceptions and where they do apply, this limit should only be increased to 28 weeks rather than the proposed 34 weeks that um, DE, DE has put forward. 34 weeks is a very, very long time for a child to wait to get services that they need to enjoy education and indeed is most of, the, uh, most of a school year. The proposed distinction between education and health provision is at odds with the ethos of co cooperation. This must be integral to the new SEM framework and to, to the fulfilment of the legislative obligations in the SEND Act. The new regulations and code of practice propose that health and social care provision is to be listed under the non-educational provision category, which does not require specification of services. So we're separating health and, and education and, and we're almost um, degrading um, the provision of, edu uh, of health and social care within the statement. Well, what we know is a child cannot learn or participate fully in their education if their health and social care needs are not met. More work needs to be done by the department on how it proposes to ensure the EA and, and the health uh, system are better able to cooperate to collect the necessary information to meet all aspects of a child's needs. Moving on, the, the, new, the new framework proposes that the, the child's primary need is, report, is recorded, which, re, which may result in the overlooking of children's other needs. We know that with many of these children and young people, that they have complex needs, they have multiple needs, and one can't be elevated above the other because we have to deal with them holistically. And there must be a facility to properly record the full range of a child's needs in the statement. The SEN framework places new and additional responsibilities in schools. And it's really important that if they are to be able to discharge these properly, they have to have proper training and support. The new um, framework also proposes that special educational provision is part of a continuum which sits alongside whole school provision. However, the code reflects the need to exhaust whole school educational strategies before considering special educational need. Now, you can understand why they may say that, because they're, they're saying that, you know, try early intervention, try a whole school approach. What's unclear is what happens to those children who it's quite apparent need specialist approach. It's not fair for, for there to be some sort of pretense at trying other measures when we know they need to go straight to specialist um, provision so that there needs to, that, that provision needs to be more clearly outlined. More worryingly, more worrying is the proposal that a child who requires stage two support, which must be provided through the EA, will only be able to be recorded as being at this stage once they're in receipt of these services. We cannot allow the current situation where children are waiting for services to continue, but are not, required, are not recorded as requiring such services. So as part of this, a central mechanism must be established by which EA monitor the number of children waiting to access stage two services, determine any unmet need and prioritize the delivery of appropriate support for each individual child who needs it. There is absolutely no point in these changes if we do not have the necessary investment to provide services to children and remove the unaccepted delay that they have been subjected to to date. In order to ensure that the draft regulations and code of practice are truly rights, uh, child rights compliant, the department must undertake a child's rights impact assessment. A CREA will assess the impact of these proposal to secure a truly inclusive education system that ensures a child's right to education is met. Also, we need to uh, make sure that the transition period from the current SEM framework to the new one will not be an unsettling time for, for many of our most vulnerable children, young people and their families. And it's vital to reduce any adverse impact and avoid any disruption to the education of children and young people with SEN. 
the department must ensure that children and their parents are given access to as much information about the transition process to the new framework. And, the ch and children must continue to have unfettered access to education and health related support services whilst this process is undergoing. Be pleased to know I'm coming to the end, Chair. So Nikki reiterates the, the pressing need for the department to provide detail on all changes and additions not referenced in the consultation document um, and a rationale for why the changes and the consideration for associated implications. We do look forward to working further with the committee as, as you continue to, scru to scrutinise the department's work, uh, the department's consultation analysis and, and um, associated revisions and the implementation of the new framework. We also look forward to coming back to the committee to discuss with you the, um, uh, how the progress on Too Little Too Late. And I finally want to conclude by saying that in light of the fact that this committee will be discussing the UNCRC later this morning, I want to highlight one of the questions that the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has asked our government to consider in this process. They have asked um, how they are ensuring that children with disabilities have access to and benefit from inclusive education, including by making mainstream schools fully accessible. Getting this framework right can provide a very positive answer to that question. Getting it wrong means we're going to have some very interesting conversations in Geneva in the coming in the coming year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Children's Commissioner. I uh, really appreciate that detailed briefing this morning to inform our work in relation to this important matter. <clears throat> I look forward to asking you your questions shortly. If I could bring in um, Rachel Hogan, Special Education Needs Representative at the Children's Law Centre. Uh, and then we'll we'll go to questions from members. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the committee for enabling uh, Children's Law Centre to uh, speak on behalf of itself and other NGOs in relation to these matters. Um, I think committee members will agree when they look at the information in their packs, there's quite an overwhelming amount of information available and a, an overwhelming amount of difficulties that have been pinpointed within the responses generated to these proposals which have been put out at a time when we're really all overwhelmed with a vast array of educational issues. And even in preparing to speak to you this morning, I found myself struggling. Where do I focus? There are so many difficulties within this and so many potentials for negative impact if this isn't done correctly. So it's really important that we have close scrutiny uh, of these uh, proposed framework in the Code of Practice and the regulations. I'd like to uh, signal my agreement with everything that the Children's Commissioner has stated uh, this morning and also to speak on behalf of the Children with Disabilities Strategic Alliance, of which we are a member. CDSA has 50 organisations within it. Um, and I think it's quite remarkable when you look at the CDSA response, the Children's Law Centre response and the Commissioner's response to see so many organisations singing from the same hymn sheet, essentially and voicing very similar concerns. And that tells us that there's something very wrong uh, with the proposals that have come forward. I see them nearly as a Jekyll and Hyde type set of proposals. Uh, I'm only really speculating here, but it looks to me as if an awful lot of work has gone in from departmental officials who we've all worked with extensively throughout this process to put a, a firm and inclusive basis of provision in place. And it honestly looks to me as if someone has gone in with red pen and written all over it and weakened all of the provisions that were meant to strengthen the system. Uh, and I'd like to know how this has been allowed to happen and how this has come into the public domain. Just to give you a flavour of our, our concerns that are in addition to what the Children's Commissioner has mentioned, um, obviously the current context isn't conducive to implementation of this framework currently. We have people support services run by the Education Authority that we know are not fit for purpose that are under-resourced, uh, the people working within those systems are not able to cope with the workload that they're being asked to carry out and to meet the children's needs. We have children on long waiting lists. To give you an example, I'm thinking of children with dyslexia. Dyslexia is an issue that we've been trying to deal with for many, many, many years through the courts and otherwise, and we've been able to resolve it because the services in place in terms of direct support aren't there. So a child might be screened in as having dyslexia and then have to wait at least a year to get anywhere near a support service. Uh, and we have heard that school principals are reluctant to put intervention in, in case they bring the child over the, the threshold where they might access direct service from the education authority. 
I think that's extremely concerning um, that we find that children are being held back in case they don't meet stringent criteria for entry into stage three pupil support services. I think we need to completely relook at the criteria. We don't have any criteria in front of us at the moment. We've no EA plan of arrangements to tell us how children can get into these services. To my mind, this framework cannot be successful if it is not um, founded on built capacity of pupil support services and built capacity of schools. And the department will talk about its capacity building efforts um, and they're simply not sufficient to deliver what is being proposed here at this point in time. Just to mention as well, the Children's Commissioner has spoken about um, health and social care trust input in relation to statements of special needs. Um, we have evidence, and I think it's also been shared with the committee by a parent, that a special school in Belfast isn't able to provide OT and speech and language therapy to all of the children who need it because of lack of planning between the EA and the Health and Social Care Trust. Uh, and that's in a special school. This framework is meant to serve mainstream and special school children. If children in a special school haven't had planning in place for their OT and speech and language needs, then I think we can surmise that children in a mainstream school, say with cerebral palsy, for example, um, are going to have huge difficulty in accessing therapeutic input as educational needs. This is compounded by the weakening of the requirement for specificity in statements. It's very clear in Schedule 2 of the revised draft regulations that the format of statements has been interfered with in a way that separates education and uh, health provision out away from education provision and puts it into non-educational needs. Now, this is contrary to the current system. So this creates a weaker statement than we have currently. And it's contrary to a line of case law that's been developed over the years, which clearly states that health input is capable of being educational in nature. Article 16 of the 1996 order currently requires the Education Authority to specify all special educational provision in part three of statements. That's the legally enforceable part. This is a thinly veiled attempt to get around that. Um, the department might in fact be acting outside its legal powers by trying to get around Article 16, which actually the Assembly and its scrutiny tried to strengthen by changing the wording to specify the nature and extent of provision because the EA weren't specifying appropriately. It's also very concerning that the department seems to be trying to get around the cooperation clause, which was also inserted uh, directly by the Education Committee and by Assembly scrutiny, um, and is trying to weaken that duty to jointly plan and deliver services by separating out health and education. A child is one child. It's one child with special educational needs. That includes educational needs and therapeutic uh, needs that uh, provide access to the educational curriculum and the social life of the school. You cannot separate those um, and they must be provided for and they must be enforceable in statements. Um, the framework that's been developed is not in compliance with Section 75. The equality duties have not been fully complied with. Um, that is particularly evident when we look at the section on inclusion, Section 14. Uh, and I was quite shocked when I read Section 14 on inclusion. Really shocked to the core because it is completely non-compliant with disability equality law. Uh, and it doesn't comply with children's rights under the UNCRPD or UNCRC. It actually gives us an example of a reasonable adjustment, sending a child out of the classroom, sending them home early. Uh, and I just can't, I can't believe that anyone with any knowledge of disability equality could have written that section. And it needs to be completely deleted and written from scratch through a lens of human rights. Um, we've seen children with disabilities being treated very poorly within our education system. The committee has heard about restraint and seclusion it's heard about exclusion, segregation and isolation within the education system. What we don't need now is a code of practice that underlines and validates those types of practices. We need a code of practice that clearly states equality rights. Uh, there needs to be a full equality impact assessment of this policy, which should have been screened in, but in fact was screened out. Um, so the other thing I would just mention is um, send us appeal rights. Normally you have a two month window in which to file a send us appeal. Um, and there's a bit of a concern around needing to get a mediation certificate before one can file a send us appeal. And uh, that has to be done within four weeks. And if it's if you can't produce a mediation certificate, you can't then avail of a right of appeal. And that needs to be changed because people already struggle to file appeal within two months. So the mediation service and the appeal rights should be able to run concurrently so that the possibility of mediation isn't lost and the possibility of appeal isn't lost. 
Um, and I'll just finish by saying really that the gateways to access to provision within this framework, which are in Article 3, 15 and 16 of the current 1996 order, are the parts of the system that appear to have been under attack um, in the provisions that have been made to this framework. Article 3 defines special educational needs. It's nearly now in the code of practice that special means exceptional. It's not exceptional educational needs, it's special educational needs. It's children who are further behind than same age peers that need help. It's a very wide open statutory uh, definition. The code of practice is trying to narrow that unlawfully. Article 3 hasn't been amended and we remind the department of that. Article 15 is the gateway to the statutory assessment uh, and we feel that resources considerations are being brought into Article 15 decisions on statutory assessments through the way the Code of Practice has been drafted. Resources are not relevant to assessment of need by law. The child's special educational needs should drive the process and not the availability of resources. It's simply not relevant uh, and could be subject to legal challenge. And again, I've already mentioned Article 16, a key provision, specification and statements. What is the child going to have and is it legally enforceable? If we come out of all of this um, with, uh, and find that you know, processes are only as good as the outcomes they produce, we want to see outcomes, we want to see early intervention. If we can't get early intervention, we're not going to be able to get the outcomes. Uh, and I would just finish by um, pleading with the Education Committee to scrutinise this very closely um, and to ask the Department all the relevant questions arising from these many submissions that have been made by all of these organisations. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, and thanks again, Children's Commissioner. You've, you've both given us um, a wealth of information to consider there and a, a range of questions that we need to ask about some very concerning aspects of the framework and code of practice. Allow me to move straight to members' questions um, in order to engage with some of those issues. And can I start by bringing in Deputy Chairperson Pat Shane, please? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks to Rachel and Kula uh, and Marie Ed for being here this morning. Um, uh, that's uh, uh, not a very um, a happy picture that you have painted here this morning about the framework. Um, I mean, one, one of the things I was going to ask you uh, was from a children's rights perspective, could you outline uh, any improvements that the framework will bring about? But after listening to you, <laughs> I'm not sure you could give a positive answer to that. However, do either of you want to try? I could, I could maybe come in by saying, yes, it can make improvements. And there's lots of, if you look at it, that's why I say it's like a Jekyll and Hyde set of documents. There's clearly an effort to make improvements, to bolster the ability of schools, to meet children's needs, which is also the school's obligation, um, to ostensibly speed up statutory assessment to put caps on the length of time valid exceptions can be uh, used for and to promote inclusion within school. That was the intent behind all of this and that was the content of all the discussions we had with the department. And I do believe that that was the intent. So I was very shocked uh, when I saw some of the, what I see as attacks on children's rights that have been brought in here. And it may be a symptom of the fact that these documents have been sitting for a very long time, being tinkered with by everybody who has an interest and perhaps that has actually corrupted it in some way. And, and I think that it can be fixed if all of the issues that we have raised are gone through systematically and addressed. They're not issues that would be alien to the department because we've raised them in conversation and through consultation. Um, this, the, this framework is being held up as a vehicle to implement the CRC and the CRPD. So when the UK is being examined and Northern Ireland's progress is being looked at, these will be held up as, you know, this is the new framework that's going to make everything better. Well, it's not going to make everything better the way it's currently framed, but I think it can be fixed, but it's going to take a lot of work to fix it. And what I don't want to see is this being rushed through behind the scenes, implemented in sort of various ways um, that we can't see. It needs to be transparent. It needs to be open. Uh, and there needs to be very significant improvements made to it. Okay. Um, um, go ahead, Kula. Sorry. No, yeah. I, 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 sorry. Yeah. I was just very, very quickly uh, going to reiterate all that and and just just say 
this, as I said at the end of, of my remarks, this has the potential to deliver what we need to, to, to deliver for our children. But as Rachel says, it's been tinkered and it's been tinkered. And we're now, now that we're at the home straight, what looks like is they they want to rush it through. And because they keep they, they have, have over the past four or five years, keep changing it. Um, and, and, and different officials and ministers and what have you have, have, have come in different issues. It can be fixed. There are hundreds and hundreds of pages in both these regulations and code. And as Rachel um, has said, that there, are, there have been hundreds and hundreds of pages in response to them. And we need to make sure that the, the, the DE have a, actually take on board and Im implement the children's rights implications that have been outlined, that have been outlined today, but have been outlined in those hundreds of pages. And there is some concern that there's now a rush to have it implemented next year. That's not going to happen. It has to be done properly and parents and children have to be informed. And, and I uh, agree with what Rachel said, so I'm not going to reiterate it, but this can be fixed. This can be fixed, um, absolutely. It's just that it needs to stop being people in in dark rooms doing it on their own and not listening to those on the ground and to families and children. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and thanks. And, and Rachel, you also mentioned the the context in which this new framework uh, is to be implemented. And what what would your opinion be of the education authority's capacity? Uh, to implement this new framework? Yeah. I don't think... Yeah, that, that's a very important point. Um, this whole framework is predicated and founded on built capacity and early intervention. Uh, and the PLP is the central plank of the personal learning plan, which is the vehicle to early intervention and to monitoring delays. The education authorities are the very early stages of its improvement processes. Um, and we're involved in a, in a project reference group in regards to that. That's going to be a medium to long term set of projects which have to be designed. Business cases have to be put forward and the department needs to fund. It's absolutely critical that the department funds early intervention to enable the education authority to provide that. If they can't react quickly enough and early enough to children's needs, we're going to be in the same position we're in, only worse down the line. Uh, you know, taking into account all that's happened during the pandemic and so on. But we've also got area planning, and we did a response to that consultation. We've got pop-up classrooms popping up in all these mainstream schools. We've no evaluation of the effectiveness of that as a specialist provision. So we've got children in the wrong placements, children moved into these um, purportedly specialist placements, pressure on special school placements, and people support services that aren't fit for purpose, that all need to be reviewed and properly resourced. Um, in a way that promotes equality of opportunity. Um, the first ARC report that came out from the expert panel said that equality of opportunity should be at the heart of everything we do. It can't be at the heart of everything we do if resources aren't allocated to promote equality of opportunity, particularly for children with disabilities within the same framework. Um, so the EA, in my view, does not, as we sit here today, have capacity to implement this, and neither do schools. Thanks, Pat. Last, last question, Pat, please. Yes, yeah. and, and, and both of you mentioned uh, difficulties when it comes to cross-departmental work and our interagency cooperation and collaboration. Could, could you elaborate a bit more on the concerns that you have around that? Thanks. Yeah, Marae, do you want to um, come in here? Yes, thanks, Kula. Um, I suppose, and it's been touched on already, um, Pat, as well, in terms of cooperation and the duty to cooperate and to jointly plan and deliver um, in terms of children and young people's special educational needs. Uh, we also have to be mindful as well of the Children's Services Cooperation Act, which also emphasises that duty. So it is very much, you know, the case that we can actually do this. I, I suppose what I'm, what I'm hearing and what I'm concerned about in terms of the, the lack of cooperation that has historically existed. Things are improving, we know that, but we still have a way to go yet because we know certainly in terms of children with special education needs, health and education have to work much more closely together. Um, and if we start looking at this, as we've all been saying, and as you'll have heard us saying, you know, ad nauseum, this has to be through a child's rights lens. And if we do this from the outset, and if we take what we have, and do this through a child's rights impact assessment lens. 
then we'll get it right. Just because something is complex, just because it's difficult, and just because we need additional resource does not mean we can't do it. We can't afford not to do this. These children have waited much too long to have the appropriate services and processes in place. So it is very much about making sure, as both Rachel and Kula have already said, that the appropriate resources are put in. And we know the Education Authority is working on this. We know, uh, and I think Rachel has already referred to the program reference group, we have a strategic development program board, which is already starting to take all of the recommendations, certainly from the Public Accounts Committee report, from Nikki's report, Too Little Too Late, from the DEC and Learner Journey, and from EA's own improvement plan forward. Now, absolutely, some of these things will take time, but there are things that we can start um, implementing now and making a difference in terms of how we take this forward. So, you know, it is absolutely one of the questions that the committee will be wanting to ask the department when they're up next week in terms of how this is being resourced and in terms of how the capacity to do this and deliver this is being met by the department. Thanks, Maria. Need to move on, Pat? Pat Peter? Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pat. Members, of, of apologies. We'll, we'll be approximately six minutes per question and, and answers per member here, so I'll, I'll need to keep us moving. Apologies. Thank, thanks for that, Pat, and, and for those answers so far. Can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA, please? Uh, thank you, Chair, and can I thank Kula and Mariette and Rachel for, for being with us today, and I think, uh, I'm sure they are aware, Chair, that uh, special educational needs and the special educational framework is an area that has indeed um, been uh, a priority of the uh, educational committee members and indeed has has indeed, uh, I think, found uh, favour with each of the members as uh, since we were uh, brought back after our prolonged uh, uh, three-year sit-down. Can I, uh, in terms of, uh, I think we have also, in our conversations, uh, indicated that we, 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 we thought that there really ought to be strong cross-departmental cooperation and indeed interagency agency working. And I would echo the, the, the words of Maria that uh, we cannot afford not to do this. Uh, we have a huge responsibility on our shoulders in the assembly to, to, do, the, to, to do this valuable uh, piece of work. But maybe, Chair, could I just concentrate a bit on uh, Rachel and indeed the, the report that Rachel has provided to us and refer to uh, some words in on page 8 of, of her report, uh, page 29, as it is in our pack. Uh, she, she's highlighted uh, an extract from our, well, our full consultation response, uh, and she's highlighted the words, is extremely concerning given the potential dampening effect upon the duty, new duties of health and education to cooperate when meeting the needs of children with SEND and disabilities and weakening of the duty to specific, specify provision within statements. Could I ask you, maybe Rachel, would you uh, perhaps expand on that statement uh, uh, and really what you think the, the impact of that would be for the children? Yes, um, I suppose we have to look at the Children's Services Cooperation Act Section 2 places a wide duty on all cooperation between all children's services providers. So it's not confined to health and education. So that's the first point. Um, we're also looking at other children's services providers outside health trusts, outside education. For example, music therapy providers, habilitation providers for blind and partially sighted children. So various specialists that might actually be out in the community and voluntary sector that provide services to children and young people, even the likes of ourselves and the support that we provide. Um, there needs to be cooperation between all of those parties under Section 2 of the Children's Services Cooperation Act. Section 4 of the SEND Act inserts a cooperation clause in particular for health and education, which is an additional um, aspect coming from the, the Children's Services Cooperation Act. So it's highlighting health and education, but not excluding others. It's making provision for a joint plan and so on. Now, in the, in the format of a statement in Schedule 2 of the draft regulations, 
you'll see that in the education section, it only asks for what is the education authority providing and what is school providing. And in the non-educational section, it only asks what's the trust providing. So all of that is incongruent with the intention of the assembly when it enacted the amendment to the SEND Act to put that cooperation clause in. And that came about as a result of the Children's Services Cooperation Act. So the department has in effect acted to dampen that response and that effort to get specificity into statements for children with special needs who also have health needs um, that require attention during the school day. One of the big arguments for that Children's Services Cooperation Act came from one of our clients who had cerebral palsy and, and was in a mainstream school and who's now happily at university and doing very well because of the support that she was given. But she needed physiotherapy and to stop her muscles from stiffening up while she was sitting in the classroom. And it couldn't be got for love nor money. There were several tribunals, and I think the commissioner actually helped in this case as well in relation to getting physio into the school. And eventually between us all, we got it. And this young woman, Carla, who's made her case public, was able to do well at school and is at university. And I think she's in her final year of university. Uh, and that shows the success that we can have when everyone cooperates. But boy, was it a battle for that young woman from the age of 12 with all of our help up until she left school to get her qualifications. Um, so these are really important provisions and they're there for a very good reason and the department can't be allowed to detract from them or to dampen them in any way. It wasn't originally the department's intention to have these in the framework, nor was it their intention to strengthen specificity in statements. We got that in through scrutiny by the Assembly and we want to make sure it's carried through in line with the intention of the Assembly. Can I just very quickly add, sorry, can I just very quickly add, Robin? Yes, um, sure. Go ahead, yeah. Just everything, um, of course, it's just that we need to, to have the same obligations to provide education provision um uh, you know we have an obligation to provide education and the same obligation obligation to uh, sp specify health and other provisions because you can't have one without the other and yeah. there is an attempt to dilute that in this and rachel's just given you really good examples of why we can't do that so there's discussions about what's in parts uh, what's in part three and what's in part six education is in part three and, and other provision, um, including health, is in part six, which is weaker. And we can't have that. You can't. You can't say if we do We have to do education, and and weaker duty on the others. It won't work for children, and young people. But you need both in order for them to have the best outcome. So Can I very briefly add to that? There was there was an intention in the in the last version of the regulations to have other health treatments and services in part three which you can see in the last version, which has been deleted in this version. So I'm assuming it was health that was objecting to this and, and the department capitulated. Okay, Robin? Yeah, I, I, I would imagine, Chair, that uh, all members of the committee would, would agree with the, the comments. Uh, it does seem to me to be, you know, in some ways we are, we have an opportunity here uh, and yet it seems some, in some ways that we are actually going to let the children and the young people down by not getting the holistic approach to things. Can, can I ask Rachel then, is it the same, uh, again on page nine of your report and you have highlighted, uh, it's all page, page 30 of our uh, pack, you, you've highlighted the areas around, if I read to just... Uh, which serve to clarify the mandatory requirement of the specification duty within statements of the provision called for to meet the child's needs. And then you've highlighted it's in bold. It is not clear and has not been explained why the department has redrafted these provisions in a manner which now deletes this terminology and therefore weakens the potential impacts of the two most significant SEND Act provisions. And really, what you've said in reply to my first question seems to be carrying through in, into other areas. Yes, I think the issue is that the department's consultation was very narrow because they previously consulted on the regulations and they wanted to keep this very focused and narrow, but they did so to the point where a lot of these changes are in fact hidden. Nowhere in the consultation document is it mentioned that the format of a statement has been revised again. Uh, and given the impact of those revisions, that's extremely concerning. So there's a number of, you'll see in our consultation responses, there's, we've uh, shown our answers to the questions asked, 
and then we've done a section on you didn't ask us these questions but you should have so there's items in there that haven't been publicly consulted upon properly which again is in breach of equality uh, duties and the equality scheme of the department to bring in changes without properly consulting the public changes which would be controversial in nature very quickly, why do you think that is the case, Rachel? It's very difficult for me to answer that question. I think the department needs to be asked that question. We've had no feedback to our responses as to why it was done in that way. Um, I'm sorry to say I tend to be quite cynical about these things. I don't think anything happens by accident. Uh, and I can only assume it was done intentionally, but the department will have to answer to that. Uh, and is that carried over into health as well, Rachel? No. Well, yes. I mean, I think that the Department of Health should be asked the same questions, potentially. Uh, you know, what was their involvement in this decision making around the format of a statement? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Important questions, Robin. Um, does that mean we need to have Department of Health officials here next week as well then? Chair, yeah. Chair, can I just say, I mean, in view of the two big themes of this committee, that this committee has been looking at, what well, two of the big things, which has been mental health and um, SEN, then I would we, we have already um, recommended that this committee consider a joint evidence session with the health committee to look at how health and education are working better for all our children, but particularly in the areas of SEN and mental health. I think I think that would that would actually uh, be incredibly helpful to moving all of these issues forward because Rachel's already outlined. You know, we can't see where he where health have agreed and disagreed with some of the changes. We can't see their role uh, or the reason, and and it would be very helpful if both were together with 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 both committees. Okay, thanks for that. I have to say, Chair, I, I think that's an excellent suggestion from the Children's Commissioner on, on a way forward on this matter. Okay. So, so, so important. Okay, I, I agree. I imagine we're creating a, a scheduling challenge for our clerk and other people as a result of that, but she's exceptional at, <laughs> at, at dealing with these types of challenges. Um, I'll bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you, Kula, Recho, and Maria. You're most welcome. I always look forward to uh, you being with us, Kula. Um, uh, I always know we're in for a very detailed analysis of the current situation and challenges facing our children, and a very honest view at that. Uh, Kula, before I go into more detailed questions in relation to what we've discussed this morning, I just want to put a question to you, slightly off subject, but mm -hmm. I think it's very relevant at the same time. As the Children and Young Persons Commissioner, Kula, in your opinion, given what has happened this week, how damaging do you believe it would be for children if the institutions fail at this time specifically? How could it impact on the special educational needs of our young people? Thanks for that question, Daniel, um, and for trying to embroil me in political machinations. Um, I... I, I <laughs> Northern Ireland is best governed by Northern Ireland. I ha I made comment during the last during the three years of collapse um, several times about how I felt we hadn't progressed um, and we weren't progressing. Uh, we are here five years after the passing of the SEND Act. We are only now looking at how we're going to properly implement it. And some, as if not significant amount of delay has been because for three years the Assembly did not sit. Later today, you're going to hear about how Northern Ireland has progressed on, the, on its obligations under the UNCRC. And again, the three years where we had no government has meant we're lagging behind on many issues um, uh, when compared to some of our colleagues across the water. So um, uh, this cannot... Uh, it, uh, uh, this has to work. This has to work. Our children, every four, every one of the 435,000 children need all of us to be at work and to be, to continue to do our best for children and young people. I don't, I'm not going to get it yet, but 
Okay. This has to work. That's all I have to say. It has to work. They need yes. you to be at work. They need us to be at work. Okay. Sure. Daniel, Daniel totally. you're, you're two minutes into your six minutes. <laughs> totally, totally agree, Kula. Absolutely vital uh, that the institution survive uh, for the interests of our young people and many other challenges that this place faces. So thank you for that. But just uh, in relation, I note that uh, you've indicated that for too long there has been excessive delays in the assessment and statementing process. We have been very, very strong on that. Much of our attention in recent times has been taken up by concentrating on delays in the 26-week period that uh, commences at stage four of the Code of Practice in relation to issuing a statement. However, there are three uh, earlier stages. Um, have you any experience supporting parents and young people who had excessive delays uh, accessing specialist support at stage three of the code of practice? And with that, are you aware, uh, even anecdotally, of regional variations in support, or are you aware of specific service delays such as uh, literacy support? So I think I am gonna I'm gonna say something very quickly and then reach out to Rachel because Rachel is works every day. So we are delay. We are very aware of variations across the region, across Northern Ireland, um, and, and we are very aware, very aware that children in different schools in different areas get different levels of service. Some of it is to do with what's going on in the school. Some of it is to do with the numbers of children in the school. Uh, we are, as you know, there, there are very long waiting lists w uh, with regards to assessment of auto assessment and, and diagnosis of autism. Um, and, and sometimes we wait too long to put a label on a child uh, rather than getting on with identifying their needs while, while we're waiting for the diagnosis, identifying their needs and responding to their needs. So there are there are uh, across across the region. Um, delays across the system. We don't record as well as we should, I think, and, and Rachel will keep me right on this, we don't record as well as we should um, children waiting um, at, at, at the different stages. It's only when we get to, um, uh, once they get to the, the formal statementing stage that we, we record data. So it's difficult to know the quantity, but anecdotally, we are aware. That, that children across Northern Ireland are getting different levels of services, and there's no and and there's inconsistencies. Rachel, I, I don't, Rachel may want to be specific. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think it's fair to say across all of Northern Ireland, all of the stage three services, which we currently call them, um, such as dyslexia support, autism support, behaviour support, access to educational psychology services, are all under strain. We don't get calls about where it's working great and someone got a service really quickly. I've never had that call. I'd like to have loads of those, please. Um, we get the calls about the children who've been waiting for a year, sitting, not able to read and write in the classroom, perfectly capable of doing so if they had specialist support and they're getting advice and strategies because there's not enough resource to give them direct support. Um, and professionals who work in the services crying out and saying, we can't cope. Can you do something? Can you do something to help us? We don't have enough staff. We're not recruiting staff in with too much demand. You know, really good people providing a really good service uh, turn their hair out because they can't provide for the children that need it. This is across the board. We need wide ranging review of all pupil support services. And I know the Education Authority will be doing that as part of its improvement process. That needs to be the priority. Get the early intervention services fit for purpose. That's going to fix lots of other problems further down the line. But you're right, Daniel. Those stages are very important from stage one to stage three. There's a huge journey to get through those before you might even need to get to a statutory assessment. And ultimately, we don't want everyone having a statutory assessment unless they need one. We want them to be helped early and maybe they won't need a statutory assessment. Um, yeah. And the distress, the trauma and the frustration that it causes is immeasurable and very long lasting. So, yeah, just to reiterate, early intervention is absolutely the key. Yeah, absolutely key. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, uh, just to go to the next question. The, the SEN framework places new and additional responsibilities in schools. Uh, and you like you little... the word next, Daniel, in, in uh, the prospect of having other ones, but go ahead. Chair, you're feeling generous. Uh, um, of new and additional responsibilities in schools, and you've alluded to the continuous training that teachers were required to fulfill the new and additional responsibilities. Uh, have you seen any evidence that this training has commenced or is being planned? Uh, secondly, do you believe that the ETA should be monitoring the quality of the training and support being given to schools? 
Do you believe it would be helpful if the ETA not only undertook a survey to ascertain the state of schools' readiness, but that they regularly, perhaps every five years, were tasked with serving the evolving effectiveness of the provision? And finally, similarly, uh, would it be beneficial if the effectiveness of the EA's provision for children and schools was baselined and constantly monitored at regular intervals? Murray, do you want to answer on our behalf? That's going to be your final question, Dan, by the way. Sorry, so if you have a final comment after this, be very brief. Yes, please, thank you, Chair. I think absolutely there is a role for ATI and monitoring how the delivery of the new framework um, is going to be, um, I suppose, assessed. Mindful as well that from October this year, the school census will only record pupils with SEN using the three-stage code of practice. And as you know, the five are being... Um, translated across, if you like, into the three stages. In relation to the question around training, I'm aware that some training has started because I have seen the guidance book for teachers that has been issued for um, them and also for parents as well by the Education Authority. So I know that training is happening. I know that the um, SEND program is all taken forward, uh, focus groups training with um, principals, and local um, locality groups as well. So we know that's all in train. A lot of this will go back to what we're putting in place and how we're going to monitor the implementation of it. And I do believe that ATI has a role. I also believe that RKIA have a role. Going back to the earlier point in relation to the fact that we have to do this jointly. And when we're bringing our allied health professionals into the provision of SEM for children in terms of support services, then it's only right that RKIA have a role as well. Um, so it is it's something, again, that has to be systemically joined up and integrated from day one. Does that answer your question, Daniel? Is there anything else you want me to cover? No, that, that's fine. Thank you very much, Maria. Sorry, could I just add to that, Daniel, one small point? Yes, there should be continuous training, and yes, it should be evaluated for its effectiveness shouldn't be a one-off, it should be continuous. Yeah. But also disability equality uh, training should be mandatory and regular. Um, if, if schools don't understand disability equality duties, they won't be able to deliver disability equality on the ground. Okay. Okay, Daniel, thanks for that. Thank you. Thanks. Can I bring in Robbie Butler, MLA, please? Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, morning, Chair. My apologies for being slightly late. A massive IT malfunctions. Uh, two computers sort of froze on me, so uh, sorry I missed the first part of the presentation. I think I joined maybe when Kula was saying, and that's uh, uh, all I've got to say on the matter. Is something, something in the round there. Uh, <laughs> but, that um, was deliberate. That was deliberate, Mr. Butler. <laughs> I, I uh, will probably not use up my full six-minute allocation because I have read both your briefs. I do know that with regard to Nikki and the Children's Law Centre, you're fantastic advocates and champions. Uh, for our young people and um, the, the first question I suppose if it just a, can be a yes or no answer if you guys like okay it genuinely doesn't need to be lengthy and you might have covered this uh, do you believe um, that your, your your voice as the voice of children has been listened to with the development of this framework and if so can you pick something out for me well, uh, can I just answer that and say yes um, and we did believe we were being listened to and we had very good relations with the team that was developing this all the way through. Um, and I can see in the regulations where our suggestions, for example, in relation to mental capacity have been uh, put in. I can see LC's application, which was a successful judicial review by Children's Law Centre against a refusal of statutory assessment has been specifically referred to. And I can see the marks uh, that the department has listened and taken on board. And then I can see that someone else has come in and done something else on top of that yes. and has um, infected the code and the regulations with provisions that dampen down all of those strengthening impacts. Kula? So I would, I would say, um, I can't sit on the examples. I would say partially. So it's the same answer as Rachel. I think we've been partially listened to. And I think in um, previous years, it felt stronger than it has more recently. Okay, cool. And I've got a, just a question for each of you. Basically, to follow on from that. So um, within the Nikki proposal, for instance, you made a suggestion um, that the uh, statutory timeframe for extension, if necessary, could be shortened. 
um, uh, would that be a priority? Perhaps I'm trying yeah. to pick up things that maybe haven't been picked up by two groups. So if you want to speak about that one, Kula, and then the one for Rachel was with regard, you guys made a comment about the capacity of schools. So the framework's one thing, but if the capacity doesn't exist within schools, and maybe you can talk about what that capacity, what you believe that capacity that isn't doesn't exist that, that you know in terms of the the, the delivery of the, the actions so Kula, do you want to go first yeah robbie I, I i suppose i want to um commend you for trying to uh, come up with a priority list but you you can't pick and choose i will talk about the delays in the time frame but you can't pick mm -hmm. and choose because all of these are necessary so you know we've, we've uh, across a number of issues but you 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 heard what i said so the proposal is meant to move from 26 weeks to 22 weeks to have a state Statement completed and we welcome um, reducing that time frame but then they've said with valid exceptions um, it should move to 34 that's too long particularly when we know up until very recently we had 73 percent of young people waiting longer than the 26 weeks to get their statement um, and all the exceptions were valid so that's just not appropriate so we we, we would recommend that that reduces to the um God, I forgot what I've said now to the 28 um, weeks and yeah. uh, that is with valid exceptions that are recorded and that are monitored both by EA but more importantly by ETI that they're independently scrutinized we can't just have this wishy-washy it was a valid exception because TELF told us it was a valid exception we need clear-cut criteria what a valid exception is and 28 weeks has to be the maximum um, but 22 weeks and less than 22 weeks the norm thank you very much Kula and Rachel yes um I agree on the valid exceptions I think as a maximum it should be six weeks six weeks for valid exceptions and they should be exceptional not the norm uh, and not necessarily six weeks less than if it can be done quicker so that's that's our view on that capacity of schools has been decimated by 10 years of austerity cuts a global worldwide pandemic We've got class sizes of 32, 33 children. We've got more complex and challenging needs in our SEND population and a growing SEND population. Um, at the current point in time, schools are telling me that they don't have capacity. And they might even be able to find someone who wants to be the learning support coordinator because they're going to have to draft all these PLPs and do all of this work. Um, so even that statutory requirement to simply have a learning support coordinator is causing um, friction and difficulty and for them to have a level of experience and a level of time to do their work um, and a level of management scrutiny in relation to that. So do the schools have the capacity? I'm not aware that they do. No school has said to me that they're ready to go with this. Quite the opposite. Schools are telling me they're in deficit and they can't just pay their ordinary bills, never mind implement a brand new system. We're still not back to normal business uh, and even for scrutiny purposes I don't know to what level schools have been able to, to really truthfully engage in detail in this, looking at this framework and understanding the implications of it. And have they had time to pick through it and find the invisible changes that we found? I very much doubt it. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and, and I know this isn't the fix, guys. I'm not suggesting it is, but obviously there are other things that are happening, like the, the uh, like Pam Cameron's bill to try and make, you know, um, autism training for teachers a mandatory sort of, and, and I'm saying there's a thing that maybe can help a little bit, but it's not the answer, but there are, there are probably a number of things, it's just in terms of building that capacity right through schools, I think. So um, thank you for, for, for giving me some clarity on that. And thank you so much, uh, Chair, for smiling at me when I have to apologize for being late. Thank you. You Thank also, you. every time you say you're not going to use your a lot of time, you always use your a lot of time, Robbie, in the chamber and in this committee, which is not a bad thing, but um, fair play. <laughs> <laughs> it, like six, it never feels like six minutes. It never does. That's why, that's why I'm here to tell you all that it is six minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, William, William Humphrey, MLA. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies, and thanks for your uh, attendance and contribution this morning. Sure, I may have missed some of the contribution because I too had technical difficulties and, and dropped out for a while. So apologies if um, what I'm going to ask has been asked. Uh, and uh, though a lot of the questions I was going to ask have been. Um, in terms of um, the Public Accounts Committee, you will be aware that the Public Accounts Committee did an inquiry into SEN uh, and we made a number of recommendations. Uh, now the inquiry having finished, uh, that will scrutiny of SEM will now obviously transfer to this committee. Um, however, the PAC has made it clear to the 
Education Authority that we will be bringing them in six months after the publication of that inquiry to ask them uh, about the progress uh, uh, around those various recommendations, which, as I've said, they accepted all of. Um, I agree entirely with what has been said in terms of early intervention. Uh, early event intervention is much more effective and it's much more cost effective as well. Uh, but it requires, in my opinion, a joint up approach <clears throat> across government. Uh, Rachel, I listened to, to you and you've talked about an infected code um, and you talked about someone going in with a red pen. Um, can I ask you, I mean, I don't have the code book that you're talking about. Who are you referring to? Who wielded the red pen and who infected the code? Well, that's what I'd like to know, <laughs> to, be, to be fair. It, it seems to favour EA statutory operations quite heavily. So my suspicion is that it would be EA statutory operations, but that's entirely speculation on my part and, and may well be rejected um, by others. But I can just see where there's been a pulling back, and you can see that particularly with the uh, format of the statement. So mm -hmm. also health have been involved in maybe negotiating um, changes that are more favourable to them. For example, the framework was meant to be 20 weeks in length, and it's 22 because health said they couldn't reduce their time scale from six weeks to four. So that was one concession that they negotiated. Um, and then around the valid exceptions, there's been conversations with health. So it could be a range of people. It could be many people because there's been so many discussions. I think the important thing now is to make sure that it's, it is improved and that those weakenings that, that have come into the system are taken out and that the, the strengthening of the system continues and that we get value for money. But the money is spent produces an outcome. It's no good just giving people money and so there's, you know, ten million pounds. What's what's been done with the ten million pounds and what difference did it make? Um, and what equality impact assessments were done? Where was it directed? Was it directed towards children with disabilities? Was it directed towards um parts of the system that need particular injection to ensure equality of opportunity? So when when the resources when scarce resources are being allocated, they need to be allocated in compliance with section seventy five as well. Um, I'm not sure that that's been done, um, <clears throat> and I don't know who's who has done all of these amendments. I know that the, the code was with the with the SEND implementation team for a long time, and that little bits of additional work have been done on it for years. And when it came out, it was not what I expected. I'm actually very disappointed to be critical here because I fully expected to be coming to the committee and praising the department for all its great work and its excellent consultation and its many meetings. Many pleasant afternoons were spent talking about all of these issues of interest. And what has come out at the end is not what the Children's Law Centre expected. So it's, it's actually really disappointing. I understand how parents feel when they work very hard to get a piece of paper and it's not what they expected. I feel a bit the same about the code and the framework. And is that a view that's shared by the um, Children and Young Persons um, Commissioner as well? Cool. I, I, I agree. Uh, uh, my team also had um, really great engagement over the last few years with, with the team. Um, I think you, 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 the journey hasn't, the journey that we've got us to where we are hasn't been obvious. How they got here, bearing in mind what everyone's um, told told government to do, it's not for it's not for us to speculate how they got. All, all I need to say to you is the logo on top of the the paper is the Department of Education. So that's a question. For, for them. So yes, it is disappointing. Yes, it doesn't reflect everything or uh, uh, that, that they were told. And it does beg the question, what's the purpose of consultation? What's the purpose of pre-consultation? What's the purpose of engagement? What's the purpose of listening to children and families who have a lot to say on this issue if you're not going to take it on board and, and you are again trying to make children fit into a broken system rather than doing the heavy lifting and fixing that broken system. Just very, very quickly, Chair, we, um, uh, Mairead represents Nikki on the, uh, the SEND Improvement Board that um, EA have set up with, with DE, and, and I know they're taking forward the PAC report. Mairead, do you want mm -hmm. to just very quickly, and don't take this out of um, Mr Humphrey's time, Chris, um, do you want to say anything? No, quickly? no. I mean, I'll, I'll not take up time. But really, obviously, um, part of it, as, as I mentioned earlier, part of the work of the, the program board is about monitoring, and, and certainly in terms of our role, it's about advising and monitoring and um, scrutinising what's being taken forward. Because for all the reasons you're aware of, 
um, we have to get this right for children and young people. So we're aware that the seven recommendations from the PAC have been accepted by the Department of Education, as you say, William. And obviously you're going to have them up before you again very soon to get a, a progress update on that, which is absolutely important in terms of your role. Um, I suppose I would say it, it, it does, um, and, and nobody underestimates the scale of the, you know, what has to be fixed here and what has to be changed. And we are mindful of the consultation finished recently, and we're looking forward to seeing the Department of Education report on the consultation responses on the regs and the code. Um, and one would hope that some of the concerns and issues we've raised today will have been addressed in the department's response and that the necessary changes will be made. Um, and where we've identified gaps and failings, that these will be addressed effectively. And this is obviously, in terms of the committee's role, something that the department can answer to you for as well. Yeah, I would just say, given the scale of the problem, um, uh, and I know that colleagues uh, unanimously in the Public Accounts Committee agreed with this position. Um, it does require a joint upness across government to tackle it. Absolutely. I mean, education, Absolutely. Absolute education cannot do this on their own. So, I mean, I would echo the, the, the point that um, the Commissioner and Robin were, were making earlier, Chair. I think there is an, uh, an imperative on this committee to have uh, officials from health along to the committee, but I would also suggest um, the communities com uh, department has a huge uh, role to play in all of this as well, in terms of dealing with SEM, but dealing with also the the outworkings of so many of these issues that affect our young people, uh, and in terms of professional health counselling and whatever, in terms of general well-being and mindfulness. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks for that, William. Can I bring in Nicola Brogan? Am I right? Again, thanks, Rachel, Kula, and Maria for attending here this morning. Um, it's really important that we hear from you. This is obviously such an important piece of work, and it will equip us next week when we're um, discussing this with department officials. So, thanks for coming and for being so honest and um, for sharing your wisdom, essentially. Um, a lot of what I want to ask has actually been discussed already, um, but maybe you could just touch upon one of the main things I want to ask about was about resources for schools. Um, it's clear the schools and teachers and teaching staff um, and all school staff will need training and um, necessary resources if they're to fulfil what's um, kind of been outlined in the framework. Um, can you kind of elaborate on what exactly you think they need? I know it's been mentioned already about the mandatory autism training, which is just one um, side of special educational needs. And Rachel, you had mentioned with dis disability equality training, which I think your, your spot on there would be so important. Um, so maybe uh, what are your views on mandatory autism training? There's been some kickback because, as I say, that's just one um, one part of special education needs or a variety of others. Um, and maybe the, if, if we kind of push that there, where we're looking other, like maybe like ADHD and other, whatever other conditions there are. Um, so what are your views there, please? I would support mandatory autism training, but also mandatory disability equality training. Um, autism is a very prevalent condition within our education system, and I'd say the vast majority of my queries relate to children with autism. So it is very important that schools understand autism. But autism is not the only uh, condition or disability that schools have to deal with. So that the mandatory training needs to cover the broad spectrum of special educational needs, including the likes of ADHD, Down syndrome, um, dyslexia, you know, any of the conditions that you can think of that might be a special educational need. But overarching all of that is disability equality. Uh, and that ties into the point about the Department for Communities because they're uh, currently co-designing a disability strategy. And I think the Department for Communities could be brought in to assist in relation to the disab disability equality aspects of this as well. Um, what do schools need? You'd need to ask educationalists that because they know what they need. Um, but one of the things that they consistently say to me that they need is not to be given advice and strategies from a specialist service, but to be given direct help. Because schools will generally, not in all cases, but will generally have exhausted their own resources before they call for something external. And when they call for it, it should be there. 
Um, just very quickly, I absolutely agree uh, with regards to training. Schools um, and uh, uh, our staff in schools need training on how to work um, and how to respond to the needs of children with special educational needs. I'm very concerned that we are elevating one issue over over another. So uh, I, I would take a very cautious approach, but um, Rachel's already talked about that. The learning support coordinators that are proposed are critical here because, again, um, I, I have a very good friend who's currently teaching at the moment of 40 years, and she, oh, she, she's got you, I've aged her, 30 years teaching foundation years, and she will say exactly what Rachel's just said. I can see the children... I know what needs to be done, but I need support. I don't need somebody to come and tell me what I need to do. I need support because I've got 25, 29, 30 other children. I also, so I need practical support to come in as early as, as, early as I, can, I can identify. We underestimate the skills and experience of our teachers and our school staff, uh, teaching assistants particularly, to be able to identify issues. But it's it's that tangible support that we need. And as we've seen budgets going into schools, particularly primary schools, diminish, we've seen less access to those services. And Nicola, very quickly, so le the learning support coordinator, supporting them to be able to access those, those supports quickly for, for, for the children in their school is, is critical. Um, and just very quickly, we're also hearing that some of the services are back up and running post-COVID and that teachers, um, obviously children coming back, um, additional needs are being identified because they've got out of the way of education and teachers and school staff, um, classroom assistants included, are struggling because some of the support services aren't up and running as, as well as they should be post-COVID. So we absolutely need to get those early intervention um, and, and trust that our teachers can spot them and identify those children who require them and respond quickly to them. Thanks for that, Kula, Mitchell. Um, listen, I completely agree with both of you. Um, I think that's the least we could do is just to, to be there as a support for um, all the staff involved. Um, and just back to Rachel, your point about the mandatory autism training and the disability um, equality training. Um, I suppose, as you said, autism is so prevalent um, um, within our children at the moment. And that kind of leads me on to another question um, about um, the behavioural conditions or um, like coping mechanisms for um, behavioural issues, whatever the right phrase is, and it leads me on to restraint and seclusion and exclusion, as you'd mentioned earlier, Rachel. Um, I'm sure you're aware that the Assembly passed a motion recently calling on um, like serious changes to be made to, to restraint and seclusion um, and to the guidelines around it because they were, they were really outdated, I think, 20 years, something since they've been updated. Um, so can I just ask your views around that there, around restraint and seclusion and exclusion, please? Children's Law Centre is involved in a departmental reference group and also with the Children's Commissioner in an advisory committee in relation to this. So we're at the early stages of really unpicking what is the problem and what's the solution um, and defining what we mean really by restraint and uh, seclusion and exclusion and isolation and all of these other terms so that we know what we're actually looking at. So it obviously needs to be overhauled. Uh, children should never be put in an isolation room. Um, the UNCRPD committee and the UNCRC have made that clear um, and we need to have very um, stringent regulation around any restraint or use of force and it should be very limited to only the time to, to prevent injury really to a child. Um, we're still getting queries in around restraints and queries around unexplained bruising and things like that into our service so this is an ongoing issue, it's quite urgent. Um, and I think it's been progressed with, with reasonable haste, but it can't be done to the point where it's done too hastily and we don't get it right. It's important to get this right. Just just to say that's the true, we, we've started our review, our surveys out uh, with, mm. with schools to understand what their practice is, and I urge all schools to, resp to respond to it. We're doing a piece of work with parents to understand their experiences, but let's be clear, seclusion and isolation of children in schools never restraint as the very last uh, measure only to, to keep those children safe and, and with strict conditions and, and, and training. We also know that children with SCN are overrepresented in our suspension and our exclusion statistics, but more worryingly, and, and, and Rachel already mentioned it in the regs, that we're seeing informal uh, suspensions and exclusions of children with SCN from our schools. You know, 
uh, keep him at home for the next week. So we actually don't know the, the extent of the issue and that has to stop. So I hope um, in this mandate, we sort out the situation with restraint and seclusion. We know what we have to do and we, and we need to do it properly as Rachel has already said. Thanks, Kula. I, I find that um, really um, unnerving, actually, the rate of exclusion. You can just imagine, as you say, just that they're deleting at home or they can't go on this trip or whatever, like how kind of commonplace that would be. So I'm glad both of you highlighted that this morning. And listen, thanks to the three of you. Um, really interesting and informative um, discussion. So thanks very much. And thank you, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA, please? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Kula, Maraid, Rachel. Thank you for your integrity. Thank you for your your passion. Thank you for your forthrightness. Really, really important evidence session. Um, a few weeks back, I want to thank you again, Rachel and uh, Kula. A few weeks back, we had that important set event where we had over 100 parents in attendance, and the feedback we had on that evening was was um, horrendous in many cases. Um, really, really disturbing, really, really worrying. But the, the news ladies were a beacon of light, they were a beacon of hope, they were a beacon of uh, support for those families and those, those children. And you're doing such a really, really important role. And don't underestimate how, how important you are to so many families. So I want to thank you sincerely for the work that you're doing to help children and families. It's so, so important. Um, one of the key messages emanating from that meeting was the importance of the education, education committee scrutinising the new sound framework. Now, we talked earlier about the importance of people doing their job. Are we doing our job? I will see for Kayla. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, uh, I think the, educa the education committee has been intensely busy throughout the pandemic. I mean, it's, I think it's amazing when you look at social media and you look at Twitter, ordinary people off the street now are sitting watching the education committee every week to see what's happening. You know, parents are starting to become more involved and have their voices heard and speak out and congregate in numbers to make their views heard. And I think that's very positive. I think this framework has sort of come at the tail end of many emergencies, shall we say. We've had to prioritise things that have been emergencies through the pandemic and it's unfortunate that the consultation was released in the middle of all that. I still don't feel I fully scrutinise these papers um, and they're so lengthy I don't know if I'll ever get time to scrutinise them in full detail but I think the Education Committee has a lot more work to do in relation to this framework and, and I've no doubt that that, that work will be undertaken um, and I congratulate uh, right back at you Justin, I congratulate the committee um, on all of the scrutiny it has undertaken uh, in recent times because it's been absolutely crucial in securing uh, positive outcomes for the most vulnerable children and young people. Uh, 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 just say the very the, the, the very same thing. This is an incredibly complicated area and, and Rachel and Neve and Maradia in my office are some of the best minds in the children's rights world and um, have, have have been working almost full time scrutinising this stuff and it's really, really complicated. I suppose what I would say to the education committee, you, you, you have, like I said, been really diligent, but you can't take your foot off the pedal. Please, you know, it's not, it, it, it's, 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 we need to keep focusing on this issue because we have to get the fundamentals right. And this framework, the code and the regulations are the fundamentals that children for several generations, because of how how onerous it is to develop these for, of several generations have to live with. So please, I understand the importance of scheduling. I understand how busy you are as, as MLAs. I understand how busy the clerk and her team are and, and amazing work that you do. But this is this this does require focus and, and it needs you to keep the Department of Education and the new minister to, to maintain that focus and remind them of their responsibilities to discharge uh, with regard to the rights of, of this our most vulnerable group of young people. So you are doing a good job, but don't be don't be resting on your laurels. You need to continue for the next year or so. Okay, I don't think there's any of us tapping ourselves in the back here. Uh, could, I think challenge accepted. I think I'll speak on behalf of the rest of the committee. Challenge accepted. Um, in terms of your conclusion on your comments on the framework, uh, Kula, I'm, I'm trying to read between the lines, but I want you to spell it out for me. You said Nikki welcomes the opportunity to provide evidence to the committee on, on the new SEND framework. Um, 
going forward, we ask that they note the range of issues to be addressed beyond the scope of the department's consultation, as we have significant concern that this will be unduly limited. What do you mean? Uh, so Rachel's already alluded to it. In the, there's hundreds and hundreds of pages, as I said, in this. The, when the department issued the latest consultation, they highlighted a range of changes. They didn't highlight them all. So what? Well, and because of the hundreds of pages, it took people like Rachel and in 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 our office, Neve and Maraid, to actually compare previous consultations with the current consultation and identify with, with, with all those hundreds of pages of eggs and identify areas that the department didn't highlight. What are the reasons for that? I'm not going to um, uh, pretend, uh, I'm not going to aspire any motivations except to say the department have to be honest, have to say these are all the change, these are the changes that we have made from the first consultation of this, and this is what it means for children and young people. Because as Rachel said, um, we've made, there's, there's so much that we could have missed, and we relied on the department to highlight those changes to be able to focus, and they didn't. They missed, they missed a few. Um, I missed quite a few, quite a few fundamental ones, um, which Rachel can uh, elaborate on, and that's just not good enough. Okay, thanks. Uh, in terms of uh, Rachel, your comments in relation to the capacity and the accountability of the systems and processes within, within which the system, or the revised system, relies upon, the capacity of schools um, in the current scenario, is this framework defeated before it goes off the ground? In its current form, it, it's not fit to be commenced, in my view. Now, in saying that, we haven't yet given the department an opportunity to tell us what its response is to our comments. Um, and they may well come back and have some changes in mind uh, as a result of that. We just don't know that yet. Uh, I'm still hopeful that this framework can be rescued. Uh, but we have to ask the question, is it better than the framework we currently have? As it's, as it's formulated today, it's going to weaken the current framework and make statements less valuable and make it harder for children to get onto the code of practice. So I don't want that to, to happen. I do want there to be availability of mediation. I do want children to have their rights for appeal in their own right. Uh, I do want the time scale to be shortened. I do want valid exceptions to be time limited. I want all of that to happen, uh, but it needs to all be um, properly scrutinised. The changes that weren't highlighted need to be discussed openly and publicly and explained, and we need to decide on the way forward. The department is literally, in my view, going to have to systematically go through these very consistent responses, pick out what we have said, collate that, and answer to what they're going to do about it. It's not fit for purpose at the current moment. It can be fixed, but it's going to take significant work. Rachel, that's hugely worrying for you to say that this new framework dilutes children's rights. Is that, is that what you're, you're... It, it is indeed hugely concerning that it dilutes rights. And if you just look at the old format, the current format of a statement, the original changes that were proposed and these now current changes you can see that process of dilution very clearly. Is that, is that not scary? Is that not alarm bells? It makes me very angry and very disappointed because the Children's Law Centre has put many, many, many hours into this and years of work into this. Uh, it's been a key focus of my particular job as a special needs representative. Um, and it's an insult to children and young people and to organisations like ourselves. We've given our time and effort and energy to the process uh, for it to come out in this state uh, and I, I don't know how it's happened I really don't understand how it has come to this because I did not see it coming and I see most things coming I didn't see this well, Rachel I'm, I'm shocked and saddened to hear that you know you, you should be the go-to person in your organizations who have been the strongest advocates for children for many years it's just really worrying really alarming and um, I don't know what to say I really don't know what to say um, but I want to touch on one final point which is the dyslexia awareness piece um, and you know, Jodie Snowden of, from Dyslexia, Dyslexia Awareness was on our call a few weeks back and she met, she did talk about the one in ten people who are impacted by dyslexia. How much um, awareness is there of dyslexia and what more relevance, what more um, focus needs to be delivered to help children with dyslexia? Yeah, I often use dyslexia as an example because I think we know how to deal with dyslexia and it's a fairly straightforward process, not to take away from the difficulty of having dyslexia. 
we knew how to screen for dyslexia. We knew how to identify dyslexia. It usually is identified most often nowadays. The difficulty is then the provision isn't there to meet the need of the dyslexic child in a timely fashion. And typically the problems will start to emerge in primary two and typically you'll be in P5 or P6 before intervention comes, if it comes, and it may not be sustained intervention. So what happens then, you've taken away from that child their ability to learn to read and write, even though they're capable of doing so. And that has a, a massive effect on self-esteem and then starts to show itself in behavioural difficulties often. Um, and to me, that's unforgivable. And we've tried to tackle that for years. We've, we've taken court action all the way to the Court of Appeal and we still couldn't get it resolved. Um, and the department was criticised by the Court of Appeal for not funding dyslexia services, but nothing changed substantially that I can see on the ground. I'm still getting the same calls uh, today that I would have been getting 10 years ago. Um, and we have a provisional criteria um, for entry into these services, the provisional criteria on the identification and assessment of needs, which only allows the bottom 2% of the population through the, the gate. And we know that there's nearly 6% of pupils have a statement of special needs. That provisional criteria needs to be put in the shredder and we need to start again and look at the criteria for entry. Okay, final comment, Justin? Um, I just want to go back to Daniel's point. In terms of the instability being threatened to our institutions, given where our education system is, given what, what's, what's happened to our young people, it would be a sin, a sin to turn down our institutions to fail our children. It would be a sin. Leaders lead, roll up our sleeves, get the work done, protect our children, help our children, do, do us right. <laughs> Fully agree. Can I bring in Morris Bradley, MLA, please? Sorry, sorry, Chair. Thanks, uh, Morris. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation of the evidence provided this morning, uh, folks. But and, and listening to the evidence this morning, I would I would question: Is this a proposed framework fit for purpose? Uh, I also agree that early intervention is significant and, and, and necessary to identify any issues that may exist early to allow for better outcomes. Uh, and looking at the issues raised within the consultation, I don't think the capacity uh, nor the resources are in schools, and I don't think it's going to be adequate to implement the processes necessary to affect the management changes needed uh, to speed up special education needs assessment uh, as a result of this review. I think more emphasis needs to be put on focus uh, training and resources, I don't think they're adequate. But could I ask Rachel to outline her concerns that the review appears to focus on exceptional educational needs as opposed to special educational needs? And could this see some children who need SEN being denied or, or make it more difficult to attain a statement and the necessary order inter inter intervention? Uh, you've just described the definition of exceptional as being too broad and open to interpretation and possible misuse. But could you elaborate a wee bit on that for me, please, but Yeah, um, Article 3 of the Education Northern Ireland Order 1996 defines special educational needs um, and it includes children with a learning difficulty. That means they have significantly greater difficulty than other children um, in relation to their schoolwork. Uh, and there's, So they're compared to children of the same age in the class. So you're essentially just looking to see um, is that child having a significant difficulty in comparison to another child of the same age in the, in the class? You can see a difference. So it's a very, very wide learning difficulties is very widely defined um, and special educational needs are very widely defined. So they're not exceptional in nature. They're just when there is that difference in performance in the classroom. Um, the code of practice, in my view, is attempting to dance on the head of many pins and in trying to put interpretations onto that that are firstly incorrect and secondly probably unlawful because it tries to say that learning difficulties should be ignored if a, if a child just has a lower cognitive ability for example um, and then you get the attitude of oh, that's all that child's capable of without any assessment of what the child's capable of or what's causing the difficulty mm -hmm. in their performance that needs to be assessed and identified so it tries to play down um, what the meaning of learning difficulties is which has been a problem throughout the years but it's certainly not in the legislation the legislation is absolutely clear um, there is a rule of statutory construction or, or statutory interpretation in the law which says that you should give words their word my meaning in a statute you don't write two pages trying to interpret them in a narrow fashion and to provide an exceptionality clause that isn't there 
Um, there's been no amendment of, of Article 3, and I've been watching very carefully to make sure there's no amendment of Article 3 throughout this process, and I will not uh, sit and watch the department try to amend Article 3 through a code of practice. Thanks very much for that, uh, Rachel. Uh, that's a major concern, uh, and children need to be given all opportunity to be the best that they, be, uh, that they possibly can uh, and attain the highest levels that they possibly can. Look, Chair, there seems to be an awful lot missed in this review, uh, and we all have to wait to see what comes back from, from the authority. But at the moment, I would say disappointed would be my reaction. Uh, and thanks, Chair. All the questions that I had, I'm just scrolling them out here one by one. I keep, keep asking them. No problem. <laughs> thank you. No problem, Morris. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, and I, I sincerely hope that the Department of Education, Department of Health and Education Authority have allocated some resources to observe the contributions from the Children's Commission and the Children's Law Centre this morning. Valuable evidence received. Thank you to <clears throat> all of you for your contributions. It is really concerning um, that we've heard that the document in its current form could weaken children, the rights of children with special educational needs, that the provision and the support that they receive, um, to the extent that it's not that the new framework is not fit to be commenced. Um, so there's there's uh, urgent and serious work for uh, the Department of Education, the Department of Health, and the Education Authority to do um, in relation to that. Concerns regards the capacity of EA Health and Schools to be able to implement the framework as well need to be addressed urgently. Can I can I ask if when the Department of Education most recently substantively engaged with the Children's Commission and the Children's Law Centre, given the, the contribution you have to make on this? Marie, you want to answer for us? Or go ahead. It would have been actually, well, obviously before pre-COVID, Chair, um, for obvious reasons. Um, we also, though, have a meeting coming up within the next couple of weeks around this um, because we wanted to wait until after the consultation date to see what response the department was making to the consultation responses um, and what they were going to change as a result of the consultation exercise itself. So. That's why we've scheduled a meeting with them in the near future. We've also got a meeting coming up with the new permanent secretary in education at the end of this month as well, which I think at the end of next week. Okay. Rachel? Yeah, from the Children's Law Centre's point of view, we had had conversations and meetings and discussions with the department throughout and up until the point where the consultation was issued, actually. And I felt the door was always open and there was always our advice was valued and we were sort of a go-to person that the department could come to to run things by. Um, and I felt, you know, that it was a very constructive relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I took the time and found the time, and I have to say there was a lot of late nights and early mornings trying to, from lots of organisations, trying to get these consultation responses out in the middle of a pandemic. I, it was only then that it dawned on me that something's gone wrong along the way here. The conversation that I thought we were having wasn't the conversation. Uh, that we were having and what was being reflected back to me hasn't made its way into the papers in the way that I would like. Um, I don't understand that. and We haven't had any discussion since. We haven't been approached since that. And yeah. I, I like the commissioner, we'd like to see what the department's views are in relation to these responses and then perhaps engage again with them. And would we, we would welcome any engagement like that. Well, obviously, the Education Committee can facilitate yeah. public on the record engagement with the departments next week um, and you can you can see what level of response yeah. we receive at that stage uh, and then hopefully they will further engage with you yes. uh, with both bodies given the level of expertise that is available are you are, are you confident that they will do that are you are you confident that they will heed the the changes that you're recommending in order for this to be fit to be commenced? Yeah, one would hope that that would be the case. I think we would have to, at this point, be um, hopeful rather than optimistic, but we would be hopeful that that would be the case because otherwise there was no point in doing the consultation exercise. And given the engagement that we've all had to date with 
the department around this and given the length of time it has taken to get us all to this stage, we have no alternative other than to get it right for our children and young people. And I think everyone is on the same page on that one. We do have to make sure that what we have in the final analysis is child's rights compliant and that does actually speak to the needs of children and young people and families who have been denied that for many, many years. Yeah, let me let me supplement that before bringing Rachel in as well. Well, then, then what 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 is the consequence of the Department of Education not getting this right? Before Rachel jumps in, yeah, go ahead, uh, uh, just to say, I um, we know. I said at the beginning of my input, we know that children with special educational needs and disability have been failed many children have been failed um, yeah. are being failed by our education system the purpose of the SEND Act of 2016 and the changing in view of the fact that it took 10 years to get to that act um, with, with, with all the consultations and, and, and iterations of it the, and then the purpose of the code uh, the new code and the regulations was to improve that situation was to make um, the system more child's rights compliant uh, with, with required additional investment. What you've heard today uh, is that that's not the, the, the regulations and the code as they stand do not fix what is wrong with our um, SEN education system and in some cases our retrograde steps. So what is the purpose of government if not to make things better? And this will not achieve that. So we have to be clear that we're laying a pathway to make the situation better, to ensure that children um, who are, are being failed, but currently by our education system, that that situation stops and they get their right to education fully met. What is currently on the table does not do that. And that's what has to change. Sorry, Rachel. Yeah, it's going to be more serious than that. Rachel, yeah, final comment? Yeah, I agree with, agree with what Kula has just said, but also um, Children's Law Centre has maintained from the very early times of this consultation on special needs and inclusion that we actually already have a robust legal framework for children's right to special educational needs and that the deficiencies in it were operational in nature. And I think we've been proved correct. The deficiencies were the EA's operation of the system. Those are now being, hopefully, and I am hopeful here, corrected um, so that the operational deficiencies will be gone, the early intervention will be, will be in place, and the legal um, provisions will be operated correctly. So my question then is, what does the new system add to that? Uh, it's capable of adding inclusion. It's capable of adding shorter waiting times. It's capable of boosting schools' capacity. Um, but is it going to do that? That's my question. Thanks for that, Rachel, um, and thanks to all of you for your, your contributions on this really important matter today. We will um, take them away in preparation for our, our session next uh, Wednesday. Um, before we move on to our, our next agenda item, um, which will uh, be in relation to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, Children's Commissioner, can I ask if you'd like to make some brief comments in relation to that? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. J uh, just uh, very quickly, um, and again, as a precursor to further engagement uh, with the committee on, on this issue, you're aware that as the statutory body, um, a children's rights institution in Northern Ireland, uh, NICI was established to safeguard and promote the rights of children and young people. And um, within that, the specific instrument we, we, we are, I am required to look at is the United Nations Convention on Rights of the Child. It's concluding observations and, and, and all its general comments. And um, that is a, a journey we have embarked on. And Mairead will give you uh, a quick, broad outline of how we're discharging that responsibility. Chair, um, just before Mairead uh, comes in, I just want to say I do have to go to another engagement. So please excuse me if I have to leave during the, this brief conversation. No problem. Thank you. Thanks, Mairead. Okay, I'm just mindful of, of time pressures for the committee, so I'll, I'll basically be as quick as I can here, um, Chris, as well. Um, obviously, because of Nikki's role in terms of um, monitoring, we have um, produced a monitoring table against the concluding observations, and obviously most recently in 2020, we've updated that in terms of the 2016 concluding observations. 
In terms of the next periodic reporting cycle, um, Nikki, along with the other three UK Children's Commissioners, has submitted our combined report in December 20, just passed. We've also led on the UK Children and Young People's Report to the committee as well. And we've also added a COVID addendum for obvious reasons, given the, the experience, um, certainly, of Northern Ireland. And we felt it was vital that we did that, along with the other jurisdictions. Um, obviously, the Department of Education is the lead department um, on collation of the Northern Ireland. Peak to the UK State Party report, and we've asked at a recent session we delivered to all the departmental children's champions. We did this jointly with CLC. Um, we've asked that that report should be published because we know that when that goes across to Westminster, to the Department for Education, who collate the main UK report, some of what we have is not included for um, word count reasons and so on. So we would like to see what Northern Ireland is actually publishing on that, um, and we've recommended that as well. Um, obviously, the UN committee have just recently, in February, there issued its list of issues prior to the submission of the combined sixth and seventh reports of the UK State Party. Um, and as this committee and other committees will be aware, our position is obviously about, and this is one of the concluding observations again, um, and one of our calls as well is about incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And we've also reiterated that call as well in the evidence session to the Ad Hoc Committee on the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, particularly given the impact of what we've um, been concerned about in relation to the impact of Brexit, for example. Um, and we've also done previous work on this in terms of getting advices and legal opinions since 2012 and more recently in 2015. Um, just want to very quickly flag up the work that we do because, we, as we mentioned in the earlier session, the importance of child's rights impact assessments and child's rights proofing, legislation, strategies, policies, um, and certainly this is very relevant to the concerns we have around SEN. So we've done a lot of work on taking that forward. The European Network last November issued a position statement and a framework tool, which we're currently uh, disseminating across departments and delivering sessions with them. We're also going to be hopefully having this included in the civil service handbook because we want to make sure that as these policy strategies and legislation is being developed, that that is actually child's rights proof from the outset. Always better to get things right from the outset, as we know, rather than leading to challenge further down the road. This is obviously one of the things the UN committee is calling for as well, and the general measures of implementation that the committee might be aware of as well. Um, we're also hoping this time to, and, and given you know the current context, we're mindful that it mightn't be able to happen um, physically, but certainly virtually, we would hope to facilitate a visit to Northern Ireland by the UN task force, as we did last time again, just to meet with people who are affected by breaches of rights as well. So as Peel has already said, happy to come back to the committee on the report and also Nikki's positions. Um, following the submission of the UK State Party response to the list of issues which they're required to do within a year. So that's due next February. Um, and obviously once that, that's done, that'll be followed by further work and discussion with stakeholders and a pre-session in September of 22. And then the committee will issue formal um, concluding observations following that. We then will obviously follow up in terms of the statutory monitoring and scrutiny and advisory role of Nikki to make sure the government departments and the executive here actually start implementing the concluding observations much more effectively. Um, and just very quickly in terms of some of the, the um, areas that we've included in our reports to the committee around um, obviously directly relevant to education, we've talked about the inequalities, we've talked about the issues around children with SEN and those with a disability, We've talked about the more marginalised children and young people and educational attainment for them. So for travellers, Roma children, asylum seekers and so on. And we've also talked about, and one of the um, things that we've repeatedly called on is about academic selection, segregation of our schools by religion, looking at the curriculum in terms of RSC being made mandatory, food insecurity and holiday hunger when children are not in school, um, and obviously the issues associated with discrimination across the groups of vulnerable children and young people as well, um, including, and most importantly, children's participation 
um, in legislation and policy development, and also service design and delivery, which, as you know, Nikki is absolutely always, you know, going on about because we know that the voice of the child is integral to getting things right as well. So that was just a very quick run through, Chair, just for the committee. I'm mindful that I think CLC is on after us around that. So I'm sure Patty can elaborate more on some of the things that we talked to the children's champions in the Department of Education officials about. Uh, really appreciate that, Maria, and, and the committee would be delighted um, to invite uh, the Children's Commission back uh, in at the suitable time to do into that in a bit more detail yes. then. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maria. Thank, thanks for Thank your time you. today. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, then, members, uh, that allows us to move to agenda item seven, Clark. Yep. Um, which is our briefing from the Children's Law Centre on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. If I could ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members and add witnesses and refer members to Children's Law Centre briefing paper on UNCRC at page 184 and give a warm welcome to Patty Kelly, the Director of the Children's Law Centre, and Claire Kemp, Policy Officer at the Children's Law Centre. You're, you're very welcome this morning, folks. You'll have approximately 10 minutes for your opening statement, followed by questions from members. Glad to have you with us, Patty. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and can I thank the committee for inviting the Children's Law Centre to provide a briefing on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child reporting procedure. Um, and as Maria uh, uh, stated already, we have been working very closely with Nikki in relation to the reporting process um, and intend to continue to do so uh, over the next uh, year and a half, approximately. As I'm sure members are aware, the UNCRC is a minimum standard of children's rights, which the UK government ratified in 19. 91, which is almost 30 years ago. The importance of the UNCRC uh, is exemplified by the fact that it has been cited in our domestic legislation, including in Nikki's legislation and the Children's Services Cooperation Northern Ireland Act. The monitoring in relation to state parties takes place approximately every five years. And the UK government, which in this instance is a state party, will be examined by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in relation to their progress in implementing the UNCRC in January 2023. But obviously this jurisdiction will contribute to that process. Uh, a reporting pro process takes place before the UN Committee examine the UK government, whereby the UK government, including devolved administrations and relevant stakeholders, such as the Children's Commissioner, and NGOs such as the Children's Law Centre provide information to the UN Committee to enable it to assess the degree to which the UK government and devolved administrations are progressively implementing the UNCRC. The Children's Law Centre has led in coordinating the Northern Ireland NGO report to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child for over 20 years. The reporting to UN Committee and subsequent recommendations will be of interest to the Education Committee as the Department of Education are leading on the reporting process within this jurisdiction. This gives the Education Committee an important role in providing oversight and scrutiny of the reporting process, as well as critically providing scrutiny and oversight on the implementation of previous recommendations from the Committee and any future recommendations a timeline for the reporting uh, to the UN Committee has been provided in a written brief to you in advance of today. However, I would like to outline the key milestones within the reporting procedure. Stakeholders help inform the list of issues prior to reporting. This takes the form of written submissions outlining areas of concern in relation to children's rights. CLC, in partnership with over 30 Northern Ireland NGOs, submitted a report to the UN Committee in December 2020. In February 21, the UN Committee issued a list of issues prior to reporting to the UK government and devolved administrations. The list is a request for specific information from the UK government, including devolved administrations, on a range of topics. The UK government need to respond to the UN Committee before or on the 15th of February 2022. 
After the UK government have submitted their report, stakeholders, including Northern Ireland NGOs, have a further opportunity to submit a report to the committee, as well as suggest questions for the constructive dialogue or examination and propose recommendations for the state party. Children's Law Centre will again lead in this jurisdiction for this process and submit two further reports, one of which will be a children's report. The UN Committee will then invite stakeholders to participate in what they call a pre-session, where there will be in-depth conversation between the committee and stakeholders on their submission. As, as uh, Maria did mention, members of the Committee on the Rights of the Child are also likely to visit the state party, including Northern Ireland, to see firsthand the issues that are facing young people. Committee members have visited this jurisdiction in respect of all previous examinations. In January 2023, the constructive dialogue or examination between the committee and the UK government will take place in Geneva. After the constructive dialogue, the committee will issue their concluding observations and recommendations. These outline key areas of progress achieved, main areas of concern and recommendations to the UK government and devolved administrations to improve the implementation of the UNCRC and consequently children's lives. The concluding observations and recommendations should then be used by the state party as a roadmap to how to improve children's rights. I'd like to pass over to Claire, who will provide a brief overview of the key issues that have been highlighted to the UN Committee by stakeholders and indeed by Nikki as well, and examples of information the UN Committee have requested in their list of issues. Thank you, Patty, and thank you, Chair. Um, can I start off by reiterating my thanks to the committee um, for the opportunity to give evidence today. So as Patty said, the focus of my presentation or my part of the presentation this morning is to just give the committee a really brief outline of some of the issues that were raised in the uh, Northern Ireland NGO report and the UK Children's Commissioner's report and then a really quick kind of brief outline on the, on the list of issues committed or published by the committee. So in terms of issues then, there have been concerns raised in terms of the impact of Brexit and the potential rollback on children's rights. There's also con concern about the potential risk to the peace process and that Brexit could lead to a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland with obvious implications for children. There are also concerns about identity and citizen rights, particularly in relation to those holding Irish passports, retaining EU citizen rights, and those holding British passports, losing access to EU citizen rights. There have also been concerns raised in terms of COVID-19 and the subsequent lockdowns, um, and you know, all the kind of shutdown in terms of you know, educational institutions, in terms of mental health impacts, in terms of childcare premises being closed, and the amendment of education legislation, including um, duties relating to SEM. There are significant concerns in relation to children continuing to experience discrimination, children living in poverty, children with a disability, care experienced children, young Irish language speakers, traveller children, migrant children, and children from ethnic minority communities, asylum seeking children and refugee children, and LGBT plus children, have all been identified in both reports as children experiencing discrimination and poor, poor education, housing and health outcomes. Furthermore, age discrimination legislation has not been passed in Northern Ireland. Other concerns raised include the use of mosquito devices. Mosquito devices emit a really high pitched sound that only children can hear and it's, they're being used to kind of disperse children from public spaces and they haven't been pro prohibited in Northern Ireland. Um, stop and search powers are being overused by the PSMI without applying the legal test of suspicion in relation to children. Tasers have been drawn and fired at children. The PSMI continues to use plastic bullets in public order situations where children are present. They've also used CS spray against children, including in a children's home. PS and I have also introduced spit and bite guards as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic as a way to protect officers, despite there being no evidence that it protects officers and actually may exasperate transmission risk. Since they were introduced into Northern Ireland in March 2020, they have been used at least eight times on children in Northern Ireland. 
In relation to children with disabilities, there is no baseline data being collected, making it impossible to plan for services or properly consider the impact of policies on this group of children. Similarly, the scale of mental health in Northern Ireland is unclear due to no regularly available prevalence data. However, from the limited data that we do have, it is very clear that mental health needs in Northern Ireland are much higher than in other parts of the UK. Urgent concerns include suicide rate being much higher than other UK jurisdictions, increasing incidence of self-harm, increasing antidepressant prescription rates, poor emotional well-being, eating disorders, low levels of self-esteem, bullying, particularly online, and increased anxiety, especially in younger children. In terms of issues relating to education, and I know Maria has alluded to some of these in her previous presentation, um, there are concerns in relation to inequalities in accessing education and educational attainment for specific groups. These are children in poverty, traveller children, rural children, care experienced children, children who have missed long periods of school due to either ill health, mental health needs, uh, suspension or expulsion, children with special educational needs and refugee and asylum seeking children. Concern also remains in relation to the use of the transfer test here and that school segregation by religion continues in Northern Ireland. The Committee on the Rights of the Child has, has issued their list of issues prior to reporting, um, which is known as the LOIPR for short, although I'm not sure if that's any shorter than saying all the words, um, to the UK Government in February 2021. The Committee has asked the UK Government, including the devolved administrations, to provide information on a wide range of issues which are significant to the implementation of the UNCRC. As an extremely quick whistle-stop tour, um, the Committee on the Rights of the Child has asked the UK Government and the devolved nations to describe what steps have been taken to ensure the protection of rights in the context of COVID and what steps have been taken to mitigate the adverse impacts of the pandemic. What measures have been taken to put in, what are, or what measures will be put in place to ensure that Brexit does not impact on children's rights? What steps have been taken to incorporate the UNCRC into domestic legislation? What has been done to improve the collection of data on, on children? What measures have been taken to protect children against discrimination? The committee has also asked for information in relation to the use of mosquito devices, stop and search checks on children, tasers, plastic bullets, spit hoods, and other harmful devices used on children. The UK government are also being asked to describe the measures taken or envisaged to prohibit corporal punishment and repeal the legal defence of reasonable chastisement in Northern Ireland. In relation to health, information is sought in relation to measures taken to eliminate inequalities in health outcomes, particularly for disadvantaged children, and what measures are being taken to address the high incidence of mental ill health and self-harm. In relation to education, information has been asked for in relation to the use of seclusion and restraint in schools, particularly against children with disabilities. They've also been asked um, to show what's been done to improve wellbeing and address bullying in schools. A number of questions have also been asked in relation to a range of child justice issues including raising the age of criminal responsibility to at least 14 years. In the interest of time, that was not meant to be a comprehensive report, but really just to provide the committee with a few examples. Can I now pass back to Patty to conclude our presentation? Thanks, Claire. The reporting to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and subsequent recommendations will be of interest to the Education Committee as the Department of Education here are leading on reporting and coordinating in this jurisdiction. This, we believe, gives the Education Committee an important role in terms of providing oversight and scrutiny of the reporting procedure for this jurisdiction, ensuring engagement of all departments during this reporting procedure and beyond. While Northern Ireland departments will feed into a UK-wide report, CLC um, would suggest that there is merit, as Maria has already suggested, in developing a Northern Ireland-specific report as part of the preparatory reporting work which can be used internally within this jurisdiction. A jurisdictionally specific report will assist and support the legislative function within the Northern Ireland Assembly and policymakers to identify key priority areas for children 
and to track progress implementation of the UNCRC in Northern Ireland through to the next reporting cycle. CLC would therefore ask committee members to liaise with the Education Minister and other Assembly colleagues to make the case for a Northern Ireland specific report. CLC would request committee members to liaise with the Education Minister and Assembly colleagues also to ensure that the Ministers from the Northern Ireland Executive attend the, the UNCRC session and conduct constructive dialogue in Geneva in January 2023. We believe this is important that voices that from this jurisdiction are able to be heard to reflect priorities from a Northern Ireland perspective. CLC also believes there is, no, there is a role for the Education Committee in terms of providing oversight and scrutiny in relation to the recommendations of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child from previous examinations to ensure they are actioned and implemented prior to the examination in January 2023. Similarly, we believe there is a role for the Education Committee in providing oversight and scrutiny of the implementation of future recommendations after the session in January 2023. Thank you for your time today, and Claire and I would be very happy to take any questions committee members might have. Patty, Claire, sincere thanks for, for that evidence given today. Um, the two, the, the, the number of sessions that we have today, extremely timely, extremely relevant, and a, a fairly clear message that Northern Ireland needs Northern Irish ministers um, upholding the rights of children in Northern Ireland. Um, and hopefully, the people with the powers to ensure that that remains the case are, are listening to all of you today. Um, really interesting to see the, the range of issues. Um, I, I think this Education Committee um, will fully step up and take on the the role that you've um, called on us to take in terms of oversight of previous recommendations. And I think, Clark, we should take some time to review uh, those previous UNCRC recommendations and, and ask uh, for an update from the Department with regards to the implementation of those previous recommendations and, and play as full a role as we can in this new reporting cycle. Um, uh, we'll seek to engage with the Department of Education on the lead role that it will take on the Northern Ireland reporting uh, in relation to some of those key issues. I mean, Patty, Claire, even, even something as, as pertinent right now as the experience of some children in relation to post-primary transfer, they, you know, there have been previous recommendations in relation to the use of the continued use of the transfer test, um, which has not been responded to. And if you if you look at um, the UNCRC's request for what steps have been taken to protect rights of children in, in COVID and to mitigate adverse impacts of the pandemic, the, the Education Minister took no action whatsoever to mitigate the adverse impacts of the pandemic on post-primary transfer. Uh, certainly in relation to academic selection, there was there was no um, action taken and it was left to schools to put forward criteria that has been wide and varied and resulted in, in various outcomes for children. We discussed earlier today, some of them extremely uh, distressed as a result of that. So you, you can see the relevance um, of the UNCRC um, recommendations, even in relation to something as detailed as that um, and why it's so important that we do engage with it. Keen to bring other other members in um, for questions at, at, at this stage, Patty and Claire. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, MLA? Uh, good morning, uh, Patty. Good morning, Claire. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the Fair Start report and uh, how that might address some of the uh, issues around access to a children's rights education, uh, particularly in regard to uh, outcomes for traveller and Roma children, for newcomer children from ethnic minorities, for children with uh, special educational needs, and, and children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And I'm, I'm wondering um, what your assessment of that report would be in terms of addressing some of those issues. 
Thanks. Claire, do you want to? Um, yes, certainly. Um, from the now, I think you have um, had Rachel in before us, and she is our shining star in terms of centre in relation to education issues. I have only looked at it briefly, so I don't want to kind of um, kind of say something that when I read it properly, I'll be like, mm, I, I'm going to kind of take that back. From what I've read, I think it's very strong on kind of early years and early intervention, um, but there needs to be kind of um, more of a focus on that kind of, you know, children that are in school now um, in terms of improving their outcomes. But Chair and um, committee members, I'm more than happy to come back to the committee um, to give a kind of more in-depth analysis in terms of that report. Sure, no problem, Claire, and, and thanks for that. We didn't have that much time with Rachel or, or would have asked her previously, and I can certainly take it up with her uh, at, at some other point. Um, just, but you did mention issues around uh, uh, children's mental health, and particularly coming out of the pandemic. And I've had some discussion and engagement recently with schools in my own constituency in West Belfast, with the area learning community and uh, pastoral support leaders. And um, they have flagged up major problems arising out of the pandemic. I mean, there already was a major problem with uh, uh, mental health and emotional well-being issues around suicide and so on. And um, when departmental officials were in front of the committee last week, we asked them about access to counselling services and waiting lists and so on. And we didn't get a very clear picture uh, of that at all. And one of my concerns is that the new uh, emotional health and wellbeing framework uh, was developed prior to COVID. And I wonder what your assessment would be, uh, how useful that will be given the impact that COVID has had on the uh, emotional well-being and mental health of our, of our children and young people. Thanks. <laughs> I, I think um, that you have highlighted an issue that is of major concern to the Children's Law Centre and has been uh, for over 20 years. There is a huge uh, underinvestment in relation to CAMS, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services right across the board. Um, less than 9% of the mental health budget is being spent on CAMS, despite the fact that um, an estimate of 29% of our children uh, are presenting with mental health needs by the time they're 18, and that is before COVID. Our experience has been the same as, as you have reflected, in that we are seeing increased numbers of uh, calls to our advice line in relation to mental health issues arising as a result of COVID, and indeed um, more serious concerns um, uh, coming through. There was a failure to um, uh, foresee and address this issue in relation to children's mental health issues and unless there is a priority put on it both in, in terms of funding but also in terms of access to services at the earliest possible stage and in schools um, then it is going to be a tsunami that will face us coming down the line. We did a piece of work or our young people youth at CLC did a piece of work a, a number of years ago uh, which we presented to the then Minister of Education John O'Dowd highlighting the need for CAM services to be available in a child accessible way in schools, including primary schools, not just post primary schools. Um, and that would remain position in, in relation to this. So I think there is an urgent need to put in a huge investment on in CAM services in communities, in schools, and even at the, the um, as a the, the more serious end in terms of um, in hospital facilities, et cetera. Um, uh, in this jurisdiction. And it is an issue which um, colleagues and other NGOs raised with us in terms of the uh, UNCRC stakeholder report as well. Um, could I just add a few additional comments to that um, in, in relation to what Patty said in terms of the budget at the moment for CAMS is sitting at 9%. Um, in 2007, following the Bamford report, it was recommended that the um, the budget for CAMS should be at least doubled. At that stage, it was 5%. Um, 
which means that in 2007, it should have been sitting at 10%. We're now in 2021 and we're only at nine. The um, draft mental health strategy that has been um, put out for consultation by the Department of Health are now proposing a 10% um, budget for CAMS. We feel that is really inadequate. It's behind the times, uh, particularly given that the population um, of children in Northern Ireland is, is a quarter. So therefore it needs to kind of match the need in terms of um, you know, the mental health needs of children in this jurisdiction. Um, as well as that, there's a number of kind of legislative issues that really fall short in terms of mental health here. So for example, there's no, um, if you have like a drug or alcohol um, substance misuse, but also a mental health um, condition, mental health need, there is no facility for you um, because you have a co-occurring condition. Um, there is no like inpatient um, facility for young people with eating disorders in this jurisdiction either. Um, and you know there is very limited um, community services. Um, there was an Irish News article that came out about February time in response to an FOI that a journalist had put in. And at that time, there was, I think, 1,200 vulnerable young people on a waiting list for um, mental health services in this jurisdiction. Um, similarly, there has also been a report by the Children's Commissioner that says even when children access mental health services, that they are not um, satisfied with the services that they receive. So there is a, you know, a massive overhaul needed in terms of meeting the needs of our young people. And as Patty says, there is a tsunami coming. So it needs, it needs to happen. It needs to happen very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm, step in, Pat. I'm going to have to stop this here. We're really, really tight for time. We've got about a maximum of five minutes per, per member here. You okay to make a final comment there, Pat? Yeah, and just a quick comment. It's interesting that both of you used the term tsunami, and, and that was at the same term that I used with the uh, mental health champion, Professor Siobhan O'Neill, uh, and, and she agreed that there is a tsunami coming at us in terms of of mental health and well-being issues uh, arising out of the pandemic. So it's an issue we need to, to address fairly urgently. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. Members, before I bring Robert in, Robert in uh, I need to emphasize we've got five minutes at the absolute maximum per member here. So forgive me for having to keep us moving briefly. Uh, Robin Newton, MLA, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I may be able to help you in your time uh, problems. Can I uh, welcome Patty and Claire to, to, to the meeting? Um, maybe could I address my comment or my question, and it's a very uh, narrow question. Um, the, the members may be aware that, uh, indeed, we have taken a, a great interest in children who have been um, in care or indeed those children who have been on the at-risk register uh, and indeed their educational experience over uh, particularly over the past uh, year. Uh, Claire in her report mentioned the care experienced children uh, and that's on, on, on our page, it's on our page 195. Could I perhaps ask Claire to expand uh, within it's your paragraph H, education, leisure and cultural activities. Could you perhaps expand on the findings and the inequalities in access to education and attainment by that particular group of children? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, so there are um, statistics that show that um, young people that are in care or care experienced um, tend to um, not do as well in school in terms of their educational attainment and all those kind of other um, benefits that come from school. Um, you also have that kind of sorry, backdrop. Sorry would, you, sorry, would you be including in that area those children who are um, at risk but living in their own homes? I think that is a different um, set of statistics and um, that would be more kind of child protection issue rather than the, them sitting within those kind of looked after children statistics, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Um, 
So in this instance, I'm talking really about you know children that um, are counted, for want of a better word, by the Department of Health as um, a looked after child, um, and you know in terms of you know, leaving school with five GCSEs, A star to C, um, the children that um, have experience of care are um, are much less likely to leave school with those five GCSEs than the general population. Um, and there's also kind of, you know, in terms of looked after children, there's a number of other issues. Um, you are more likely, if you're in the care system, to become involved in the in the juvenile justice system. You're more likely to be, um, like, have interfaces with the police. You're more likely to um, be found in Woodlands, um, the juvenile justice centre in Bangor there. Um, to the Children's Law Centre would regularly ask for a breakdown of statistics in terms of who is in, the, in, in Woodlands and always at least 50% of those children come from the care system and given that we are all the corporate parents of those children I think there's a real, a real failure there in terms of you know, properly you know, putting in place what those children need. Pat, do you want to add anything? Yeah. I, I just wanted to add that um, this is this is not a new issue uh, in terms of reporting to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, and, and you may remember, Robin, whenever you were Minister uh, for Children or had that res lead, uh, overall arching responsibility that this issue was raised. So there have been a number of recommendations in relation to the discrimination ch children who are in the care of the state face, including in relation to educational attainment. And what that highlights for us is the imperative in terms of monitoring the recommendations and the observations that are that the committee actually issue and it's been a failure to to actually ensure the implementation of those recommendations that leaves us in the situation that yet again we are having to report to the committee in relation to this issue yeah and maybe patty why is there not i mean a uh, uh, this is an area that has interested the, the, the committee members in general, and I think if the others wouldn't mind me saying this, uh, particularly Justin McNulty and myself, um, were, first of all, for, for the care of experienced children, which I think is, a, a, I was going to say, it's a relatively easy one to address, that relative, but you have this other category of the children who are at risk you haven't included those children uh, within your uh, groupings um, under education, leisure, and cultural activities. Is there a need for those, or, or, or uh, am I being uh, too particular there in terms of the at-risk children to be included with maybe along with the care ex experienced children? I am, I am not aware of specific data um, or research that looks at children who are on the at-risk um, uh, register vis-a-vis um, -vis educational attainment. And it certainly wasn't raised with us by agencies that uh, lead on those particular issues whenever we were compiling the report. Um, again, we could go back and interrogate that further, um, but I'm not aware of any specific data. Um, what I would say is that um, there are other groups of children as well, I know you're looking specifically at looked after, where educational uh, attainment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the issue of de discrimination has been highlighted. For example, Roma children, traveler children, um, and uh, and others, but again, it has never been highlighted to us by um, children who are leading in relation to child protection issues. Yeah, yeah. That, I'm, that's... Actually, I'm actually not sure that there there is any research, uh, and maybe that's something like colleagues in uh, in academia might wish to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that does surprise me. I have to say, Patty. Surprise me that that is not the case, uh, as you said. But okay, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that, Chair. Hope that helps with your time constraints. And thank you to Paddy and Claire. Chair, can I just add one sentence in that you know the issue that's just been discussed there highlights the lack of data in terms of children and young people in Northern Ireland and the need for that kind of more comprehensive, wide-scale collection of data, so we know as you know, 
policymakers, as legislators, um, as you know, people that lobby um, for children's rights, that we know where the key priorities are. Because without that data, we, we don't know and we can't interrogate it. Okay. Yeah, I was seven minutes, so not really, Robin. <laughs> uh, I, with fear, go to Daniel McCross in MLA. <laughs> Keep it moving, Daniel, thanks. <laughs> Daniel may be having issues with his connectivity there, actually, I'm being advised, so um, he is saving me. I'll move to Robbie Butler, MLA, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, probably slightly on the hop, so I have to get my papers out here. Um, thanks, Paddy and Claire, um, for your report. It's a lengthy report. It has numerous numerous topics across it um, and there's so much would like I, I would like to pick out of it uh, with you there's much that I agree with and I'm really really pleased to see some topics on there um, not necessarily want to discuss them reasonable chastisement is a really good um, debate that we need to have and, and we need to move on age of criminal responsibility absolutely I worked in um, the prison service for a number of years uh, never had the, the, the chance to work in the, in the juvenile sector, but I've still got a lot of friends in, in there, and I believe that some of our approaches certainly need to be uh, modernised and so on. And you've highlighted a, a lot of stuff in there. Um, please forgive me for, for, for going for this one, if you don't mind, but I think it's pertinent that we do. And Claire, you did raise this one, okay? So it'll probably fall on you to answer. So you talked about uh, Brexit. You talked about the impact on Brexit on... Um, you talked about the threat of balance, okay? So the first thing is that I want you maybe to expand on that in terms of just the evidence base for that and where that was coming from. Secondly, concerns about regarding the identity and citizenship of, of young people, which is fair, but I see no reference to the protocol. Uh, and, get, and given what has um, happened over this past few months, um, there doesn't seem to be any recognition um, of the fears uh, uh, that are that that legitimately are held by um, children who have a Northern Irish or British identity or from the loyalist community. Can you just wonder that one first? Um, yeah, Robbie, maybe I'll come in actually on that one. Um, I think what we were alluding to when we talk about children who identify as British is that there may be some rights that uh, children who maybe identify as Irish or Irish passport holders um, will be able to enjoy um, that those who identify as British will not, and that is a major concern uh, for us. So what we would like to see is that all children uh, enjoy equally the maximum amount of protections um, in relation to children's rights, and that there will be no laws for any section of our community in relation to children's rights as a consequence of Brexit and the protocol. We did some research um, prior to um, the withdrawal agreement um, uh, um, uh, in relation to Brexit and try to scope out the potential implications uh, of Brexit and children's rights uh, in this jurisdiction. Uh, so, for example, there are issues like um, issues like child protection. So, if you have somebody, for example, um, living in Donegal who is providing services, working across the border, um, and uh, in, for example, in Strabane, uh, and has contact with children uh, under, as a result of Brexit, um, unless uh, there are uh, clear agreements around GDPR, uh, etc., um, then it might be proved problematic in terms of getting uh, uh, checks in relation to child protection for those individuals. Likewise, yeah. if there is somebody who, who um, um, uh, is being sought by PSNI in relation to um, child abuse or something like that. There will be difficulties in relation to um, uh, the well, uh, uh, potentially. Paddy, Paddy, you're going to eat up all night time here. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to jump in, sir. I get that. I have no issue with that. What I'm saying is, so with regard to the the, the threat of balance through a, yeah. a, border, a border between uh, north and south, there's no, there's nothing in here. Now the document may have been completed. A number of months ago, I'm not sure. But there's certainly the protocol hasn't been mentioned, and there has been street violence, and I'm concerned about the safety of our young people, especially as we move into the summer. The protocol hasn't been mentioned, and that doesn't seem to be uh, in balance. To be fair, um, okay. it, it does, I, and I know you're inferring that it's the cover all. It doesn't say that in the document. I don't want to get bogged down in it, but if it's if it's either the document was written before, fine, and maybe it needs updated to to and the identity piece. So I get the mechanics, and I agree with you. By the way, we need to make sure that Irish citizenship. British citizenship and European citizenship, we need to protect that. But we know our young people in this, uh, yeah. and our young people unfortunately fall under the influence of people, you know, 
with influence, shall we say? So I'm just asking, could that be picked up, Patty? Is that okay? Absolutely, and and, um, and we have highlighted the fact that we are doing an update report, um, okay. and, and we'll do that. But I also want to highlight something. Yes, the report was done December 20 before the the very yeah. worrying uh, violence in, in Easter this year. But the Children's Law Centre, and this is out with this, are actually doing a piece of work where we're just about to out to out in, in partnership with an organisation in Dublin to actually scope out this very issue. Uh, to do, we're going to scope out it through a piece of research, um, uh, and one of the issues that we will be looking at are those very issues that you've been talking about. So we're going to scope out the um, the impact of the protocol in terms of children's rights um, uh, and children's lives uh, um, in this jurisdiction. But we're also going to do a piece of research directly with children and young people themselves, and that will include children from all communities. And we've set up an, uh, an advisory group that will help us to identify those children, and most certainly it will be the children from the PUL community as Go well. On. Thank you. It will be highlighted in the next room. I'd be honest, yeah, no, I, I, to be honest, I sort of kind of assumed, but didn't want to assume, that it was a bit of an older report. So thank you for that, guys. It's not, that CLC, well, probably, thanks. Yeah, CLC are doing fantastic work, so it's just to making sure it's not missed. Last one then. Um, so there's a piece in there about religious education um, and, and in terms of that it's a, the mandated and so on. And, and there is a conversation to be had of no, with regard to the provision, and also the fact that you guys picked up that all faiths aren't recognised, which is an absolute, we, we, we can understand that. But how do we, I would, I would contend that Northern Ireland is a predominantly Christian country and that, that you know, the Christian um, faith still has a place and should, still should have that provision, um, uh, however we do that. Um, how do we respect all faiths um, with without the diminution? of uh, the Christian faith. So, so it's a bit like education. I see this as a matter of pulling everybody up and respecting all faiths and none. Is that is that the strategy or, or the recommendation that that's what we would be doing and it's not to be a, a process of diminution of, um, for instance, the Christian faith, which is still the predominant faith here in Northern Ireland? I have literally no idea how you squeeze that in after five minutes, by the way, Robbie, but Patty, Claire, have a go. Thanks. I'm stuffed on time now. Go ahead. <laughs> There, do you want to? Yeah, sure. And um, I, I'll try and do it as quickly as possible. In terms of the um, kind of the worship in schools, the mandatory point, Robbie, um, the, um, I suppose the recommendation is that um, where you're in a faith-based school, if, it's, if you decide as a child or as a family that that's not a part of the school day or school life that you want to be part of, that there is the option to opt, opt out. First of all, the second one in terms of um, kind of recognizing all faiths and none, absolutely. It's just, you know, like um, in terms of the representations that we um, received from other NGOs in terms of their issues that we then put into our report, um, it was felt that, um, you know, I think it's maybe year 10, you have a few modules in terms of other religions, but, in, but that's it. So, you know, in terms of that kind of, you know, wider piece that there should be kind of focused throughout your school life in terms of other other religions and you know learning about you know you know what other other traditions i suppose in terms of how people um have a relationship with god and also in terms of kind of what those religions believe it's just it needs to be a kind of a wider piece i suppose hope that answered your question as quickly as i did it yeah. the chair is going to get fed up chair you can move on thank you guys thank you Robbie. <laughs> Only eight, only eight minutes. Uh, Nicola Brogan and then Justin McNulty, please. Thanks. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Patty and Claire. Um, again, a really informative um, briefing this morning. Really do appreciate your time. I'll get right into the questions too. Um, what I want to touch upon is relationship and sexuality education within our schools. Um, I'm sure you all saw the Ofsted report last week from England and Wales which honestly I find so shocking. I really hate the fact that girls and boys, but mostly girls, actually don't even bother reporting the sexual harassment um, that they receive or experience, whatever the right word is, um, because they don't think it's important or it's, it's been normalised um, and that people aren't going to listen to them. Um, I really, I, I was so disheartened reading that last week. And, you know, although that was based in England and Wales, I'm sure we've got the same concerns here. And we definitely need to kind of um, 
focus on that and kind of raise the importance of it. So I'm just going to keep talking about it because I do think it's so important. So really where I'm going there is about, um, as I say, the relationship and sexuality education within schools and to make all children and young people aware that um, about what a healthy relationship is, um, what healthy sex is, what consent is, what um, pressure you're putting on people when you're asking for maybe um, like explicit photos or anything like that there, which I think is so prevalent now among young people. Um, so yeah, I think that RSE within schools should be, I know they say it's mandatory, but um, it seems to be they, they can kind of cherry pick what they want. Um, different schools can kind of cherry pick what parts of RSE they want to incorporate within their schools. Um, so yeah, I think it should be made mandatory and standardised and modernised. Can I have your viewpoints on it, please? Do you want me to pick that up, Pam? Um, yeah. Or in the interest of brightness, Nicola, I couldn't agree more. So, um, you know, and that will be our recommendation to the committee in terms of in the next stage, um, in terms of stakeholders' input. One of the kind of aspects of our report is to put forward suggested recommendations, and that will be one of ours. So, it needs to be mandatory, and there needs to be that kind of minimum standard in terms of relationships and you know what is healthy and what is safe rather than schools deciding, you know, how they kind of educate in terms of RSE. So, yeah, we're definitely on the same page in terms of that. No, that's good. Thanks for that, Claire. I think a lot of times people um, hear RSE and straight away think about sex and about, like, reproduction and that, and that kind of side of it, and they don't focus on the relationship side of it and, like, the respect and love and everything that comes with it, you know, so I think that's a really important part. Um, that's really all I wanted to ask you. I do, I just want to point, make a point of, that you'd made, or touch on the point that you'd made earlier, Claire, about... Um, services for children and young people with eating disorders. Um, this only kind of come to my attention recently about how there are such few services um, and obviously such an important um, thing. So something I'll be focusing on in the future as well and hopefully maybe get working with you on. But thanks very much to both of you for your briefings. Really, really, really interesting. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Nicola. Uh, at least one member listens to me. Cheers. <laughs> Um, good, thanks for those uh, important questions as well. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA, please? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Paddy and Claire, for your important evidence session today. Um, I just want to touch on something in relation to the right to an education that enables children to fulfil their potential, which is fundamental, I would say, in terms of the rights of kids. How come there's no... Um, mention of physical physical education, physical activity, and how important role that plays in the terms of the child's development, the child's education, the child's mental well-being, the child's emotional well-being. I don't see any mention to the physical well-being of children in terms of their physical education. Justin, are you talking about in our stakeholder report? Yes. Yeah, um, basically the, the committee have, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child took a very holistic um, approach to education. So when they are actually talking about a right to education, they're talking about it in a very holistic, so it is physical, mental, emotional and, and academic uh, as well. And um, uh, the importance of allowing all children within that context to realise their full potential. What is in our report um, is what, as I said, over 30 Northern Ireland NGOs report, uh, um, uh, contributed to the report. So what it is uh, in that report is what other NGOs in their work directly with children and young people raised with us. So it isn't just the Children's Law Centre's perspective. Uh, so we were reflecting, we were collating all the um, information from their evidence base. Um, uh, and that's what informed our report, and that's what, what was contained in the report. This issue wasn't raised with us. It's not an issue that we, uh, in terms of physical education, that we would have a direct practice in or evidence base. Therefore, we were not in a position to do it. But have, you having now raised, uh, raised it, um, and in the context that we will now be going, uh, doing a subsequent report to be submitted to the, to the committee next year, um, we will take that away and um, see if there is an issue that, uh, that other uh, NGOs have an evidence base that can inform and then put into the report. Okay, thanks, Paddy. I would suggest it's a glaring omission, a glaring omission in terms of the, the whole the whole piece um, around children's education, children's well-being, physical activity, 
is critical. Is there particular um, NGOs who are working in that area or others who uh, might be able to provide us information on that issue uh, from their practice base that we can then include in a subsequent report? I think I think the sporting organisations across the north, the GEA, the Ulster Rugby, uh, Hockey, Soccer, um, they could all provide you with information in terms of the, their uh, understanding of children's activity. But um, for me, it's more fundamental. Children are not getting their requisite 60 minutes of activity a day. They're not getting it. And that's, that's, a, that's a failing of our education system. And yeah. Yeah. Just if I just supplement that very briefly, the, there's a, as Dustin would, would always highlight as well, the recommended fit PE hours per week or two hours per week. So you could very easily inquire with the Department of Education as to whether that recommended amount of PE per week is being provided to children and young people across Northern Ireland. And we'd argue that we'd assess whether or not they're having uh, their right to fulfill their potential, as Justin says, their physical potential. Um, being being facilitated or not, I, I think that would be a, a measure that you could you could uh, engage with. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, sure. Sure. Could I just add one items in in terms of that? In terms of the uh, right to fulfil their potential potential in education, it is you know taken by the committee um, very um, in a very broad brush. So it does include physical education. Um, and you know, we as a Tunstall Centre would argue that education isn't just about educational attainment. It's really not. It's about you know developing skills in all those areas. Uh, and we find it really frustrating that when schools or the education system is being measured, that the measure used is leaving schools with five GCSEs, and you know there needs to be a focus outside that kind of educational attainment. Yeah, it goes back to what is education about, and it goes touching on, on what um, was said by the previous speaker, you know, how children develop their ability to respect and understand the consequences of pictures on, online or otherwise, um, and develop resilience. Is that, is that a measurement of educational attainment? I think it should be. Yeah. You know? um, you've, uh, Claire, mentioned the lack of data in the North. Um, I'm touching on Robin's point again, looked after children, at risk children. Um, what are your concerns about the lack of data in the North? Could you just give us more information on that, Claire? I'm a little bit worried about that. Yeah, so like the last kind of wide scale kind of data or survey that was done in terms of children and people with mental health needs was like 1999. So to those young people are adults now, they're grown up, and you know, young people that are young people now are living a completely different world to teenagers in 1999. Now, there was a kind of smaller scale survey done about two years ago, um, but not on the scale that we need. In terms of children with disabilities, for example, um, the Department of Education and the Department of um, Health um, collect data and the definition of disability is different in each department. So that means we have no idea really how many young people in Northern Ireland have a disability and how do we plan services for those young people. Um, and you could you really pick any issue and you'll be like, I don't have enough data on that. Like and you know, and the program for government and the children and young people strategy it's all about outcomes-based accountability now. Like that's the the new show in time. So it's really important, given that it's going to be data-driven, that we have the right data. And like as an example, um, initially it was um, proposed that um, in terms of measuring mental well-being in the north, um, that we would use the general health questionnaire, um, which doesn't include under 18s. So like. Uh, you know, automatically there's an issue, um, and that happens. You know, we find that in our work a lot, and um, so there almost needs to be, first of all, like almost like a, a bringing of heads together in terms of let's look and see what data we all have, and identify the gaps and where do we, you know, where do we need to go from here, and commission, you know, the new data that needs needs to be kind of collated, I suppose. And as well, I'm going to have to, going to, have to stop us at that point. We've, we've, we've run out of time. Claire, apologies. Just a final comment. Well, that just says you're, you're working blindfolded to a certain extent, Claire. 
Yeah, absolutely. Unbelievable. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Patty. Definitely something that we could specifically take up uh, in relation to that particular matter, Justin and Claire. Um, Thanks, thanks, Justin. Uh, Patty, Claire, sincere thanks um, for your uh, expert evidence today. I'm genuinely sorry we don't have more time, um, but I'm sure we'll be able to um, bring you back to the committee at a, a future date. Um, Patty, do you want any final comments yourself? Yeah, um, I mean, in relation to um, uh, the, the comments and questions today, um, I'm wondering if the committee might consider actually doing an, a dedicated session on issues, um, a previous recommendations that are specifically related to education that the UN committee have made, um, and then specifically issues in relation to education that have been highlighted in both the stakeholder report and list of issues report, uh, because there are quite quite a lot of those, and it may be of interest um, to the committee to actually interrogate those in a bit more detail. And I would suggest that uh, that, that might be uh, useful. Um, and in relation to the reporting, I would just re-emphasize our request to the committee um, that uh, given the Department of Education's lead role in relation to that, that the Education Committee um, engage with the department in terms of uh, how they're taking that forward to ensure um, that there is as much um, uh, emphasis uh, in relation to this jurisdiction uh, in the UK wide report. Thanks for that, Patty. Re really helpful summary. And I see uh, Clark has, has noted uh, those requests, and the committee will action those for you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Clark, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and add members back into the spotlight? and ask the clerk to summarise actions or requests from all our, our briefings today. Members, I understand we're at quorum here. Um, would, um, hopefully people can stay until we finish our committee business here. Thanks, Clark. Okay, so Chair, I'm recapping on three sessions, the joint session on uh, special educational needs, uh, the NICI session on UNCRC and their particular role in respect of that, and then the Children's Law Centre um, session on, on CRC. Um, the uh, highlights of the SEN one really are you know, to, to feed into next week's session with the Department of Education. Um, witnesses uh, felt that next week's session would be much more valuable if it had um, witnesses from uh, the Department of Health and the Education Authority as well. The Education Authority have already fed in and will be at that meeting. And I've um, made contact to um, establish that we can have some Department of Health uh, officials next week for, for completeness. Um, some really strong messages were, you know, restraint and seclusion. The Children's Commissioner, you know, wants us to get that sorted this mandate. Um, and in respect of the code and the framework, a lot of specific issues came up. But, you know, the, the main thing was transparency, the need for transparency about iterations of these massive documents. Um, the sector has been feeding in over a period of years and, you know, shouldn't be shocked at, at what uh, comes out um, at this point. Um, so there's ne a need um, for a narrative um, from the department. Uh, in, in terms of those, terms of those issues for the, the department um, on the said framework, um, I'm, I'm happy for us to take it as, as read that you've noted the detail of that and maybe just to confirm that we will forward those to the department in advance of next week to expect answers from them in relation to it and, and also that um obviously we as committee members can be supplied with those questions to present them to the committee next week and then also yeah. that um department of health and and or uh, well no and education authority officials might be invited as as well but if you if you summarize yeah, all those been issues been we might be here to one yeah. uh no no um the uh <sighs> No, sorry, I've lost my... You're okay. You're okay. Um, no, I mean, that was the main thing that came out of this session, um, the impact of each change on the human rights discussed and an explanation of that in public. So the committee will get that next week. Um, um, the uh, officials have been asked to come um, and there, there is a hand card being prepared of all of the three evidence sessions today. So... 
members and the committee team will interrogate that in preparation for next week. Um, the Nikki then update on UNCRC. Um, there's an action coming out of that for Nikki to re to report back to the committee um, after the summer um, on the statutory re supervision rule that is exercised by the commissioner. Um, and then for CLC, um, there are actions in respect of um, an invitation that uh, for the education committee to assist in oversight and scrutiny of current recommendations and the implementation um, of previous recommendations. Um, and the members had specific areas of interest which they can take up with officials next week as well. Thanks, Chair. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, thanks for that, Clark. <laughs> members content to agree those actions? Do you wish to add anything else? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thanks for that, Clark. <laughs> members, we just have uh, correspondence and forward work program to discharge. Um, I, I apologies as well for having to move us so so promptly, but we're, as you know, um, every so often we're only allocated nine o'clock to 12 o'clock for some reason, and, and that's that's what I'm being driven by here. Apologies for that. Um, Clark, agenda item seven is correspondence. Can I refer members to page 202? 23 items of correspondence and a summary note at page 204. Clark, you okay to speak to that correspondence, please? Thanks. Yes, Chair. Um, so item 83 on page 213 is a response from DE on supporting Irish medium education. Um, the department indicates that it has made a bid for additional funding to support language acquisition in Irish medium schools. Uh, members, if you're content, we can forward that response to um, Corlea Nagil Scaliocta. Um, is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. Thanks. Um, item 84 on page 216 is a response from the Department on Accountability of School Governors. Um, this refers parents with complaints about school governors to the school complaints procedure and following that to the Public Service Ombudsman. Um, it, members, if you're content, uh, we can forward that response to the correspondent who raised those issues with the committee. Agree. Thanks. Item 85 is a response, uh, that's on page 224, is a response from the Minister um, about childcare and also about CAMS. Um, progress with the childcare strategy will be subject to resource. Um, and the Minister has provided details of waiting lists then for CAMS, um, which is a snapshot from 21st of May 2021. Um, and this indicates that while the demand for counselling has increased, it hasn't currently overwhelmed the independent counselling service for schools. Um, so members, what are your views on that? Yeah, Clark, if I come in relation to the childcare, I'm get this this was the message that we received from the new minister yesterday as well, and I'm getting really concerned by it and slightly frustrated. Um, this comment that so the ch a childcare strategy has been a programme for government target since I entered office in 2010. Um, the, the, the comment here that the, the, it remains the department's objective to progress the strategy as quickly as possible, um, but that the pace will ultimately be determined by resource availability and COVID-related pressures. The, the, the implementation of a childcare strategy will be to an extent determined by resource availability. The, um, the publication of a childcare strategy um, should be deliverable. Um, so th th this is really concerning, really frustrating. Um, it, it looks like it's an excuse for not delivering a childcare strategy. Um, and it's, it's not acceptable. Um, we've, we know how crucial early education and childcare is to early years, to equal opportunity, to uh, gender equality and access to education and employment. This is this is really concerning, really disappointing, disappointing and frankly quite frustrating. Um, do any other members want to come in on that? Yeah, can I come in there, Chair, please? Yeah. 
Um, listen, I completely agree with you. Um, it is a really disappointing response. And I think given the calls yesterday, um, that the Department of Education and the economy should be kind of coming to the fore on this here. Like I echo those calls as well. As you said, it has, has such a wide range in effect. It's not just about um, one kind of sector. Like, uh, for example, the gender inequalities that it imposes um, on women and that. Um, so I completely agree with you. As you know, I sit in the child care APG with you. And um, like we know the issues that are facing the child care sector and they really need, do need support and help. Um, so I, I think we need to get moving on it. Thanks, Deborah. Yeah, Justin, go ahead. Now I'll propose an action here. Yeah, it's just a cop out from the minister. It's a dereliction of duty, unacceptable. If members are content, I think we we respond to articulate that uh, sentiment, but also to to ask how the how the the publication of a of a plan is is determined by resource. Obviously, any work is determined by resource. But the Department of Education shouldn't need additional resource from the executive to devise a strategy for which it is responsible. And that's just ridiculous. Um, so if we can ask, you know, how the publication of a strategy, which has not happened in over 10 years, is, is somehow now resource um, determined um, and, and advise that we need to get on with this. A specific action was... Uh, I'm loath to refer to the old party group on early education and child care, but there is crossover here. Um, a specific action was agreed that there would be a, what is called an insight lab with the, the greater child care sector. There's some great minds, great people involved in that. Um, that was due to take place in June. Now, my understanding is it's now being scheduled for the autumn. There are specific actions that the Minister for Education, the Department of Education, can be taking in relation to progressive childcare, and you know, one paragraph responses to the Committee of Education to say the pace will be determined by resources. It's it's a disgrace. Um, so sorry, Clark. Draw a line under that. There. Hopefully, that's a clear enough action for you members. Content to agree that approach. Agreed. Okay. Thanks, Clark. Okay. So in respect of the counselling um, part of the the letter. Um, I thought it might be useful to request to respond and request a flowchart showing the stages of triage for counselling. Um, you know, so what happens after assessment, for instance, um, if members are agreed. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Yeah, yeah agreed. Okay. Um, item 86 on page 228 is a response from the department providing further information on the Addressing Bullying in Schools Act. Um, the department is unable to provide statistics on suicide attributed to bullying um, and the committee had asked about discrepancies um, between data provided by the department and in the TIMS report um, and so we're going to follow up on that, on the, on the detail of that with them. Do members have any other views on that response? I think it's pretty disappointing that they can't provide us with statistics. Um, don't want to go into too much detail given the topic that we're discussing, but it, it notes that the recently held data held on uh, death by suicide in Northern Ireland is now known to have been inaccurate, as it included um, deaths that were drug-related deaths, probably not deaths by suicide. Uh, that sounds like a, a significant error. Um, I can't, it's a, it then reads, I can't help advise that Northern Ireland has a persistently high suicide rate, um, includes disproportionately higher rates of death by suicide of young people. Um, the youth wellbeing prevalence study shows that one in 10 young people self harmed, one may have had suicidal thoughts. So um, I suppose the, the response is well, what, what is being done to address that error? Um, and this goes back yeah, to the children's, yeah, Justin. This goes back to the children's law centre concern around data. You know, we're acting blindfolded. We don't know the, the actual stats. How can you make change happen to address those stats in the first place? And I know it's a very, very sensitive issue. How how you're able to manage this is tricky and uh, hard to navigate, but it's still important information to know. And and is this is the the data that was held 
in Accord, is that Department of Education data or is that Department of Health data? I think it was Department of Health data, Chair. I think that some time ago that that discrepancy was, um, or that that error was, um, was okay. realised. Well, yeah. We can, we can ask you yeah. know, what the explanation has been given for the error and has it been corrected and will, will we be able to track this data now going forward? Okay, members, yeah. can tell? Great. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so item 8-9 on page 267 and also the item on page 269 are responses from the Education Authority and the Belfast Trust about speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, phys physiotherapy in special schools. Um, and it describes how collaboration um, is carried out to deliver those. Um, but basically, um, due to increasing demand, work is ongoing to meet all children's needs and additional resources are required to meet forecast need. Um, members, would you want to consider holding a, a briefing with the EA and the department on this? Or yes. would you prefer to refer to the health committee? No, no I, okay. I, I, I think we should debate Clark, if memory serves me correct, this corresponds is in response to a fairly detailed letter from parents in relation to concerns about the wide range of therapy provision at their school. Okay. Yeah. I think we put your response here, the substance of which is about a paragraph long that says engagement between the sector is regular and ongoing. And as we ascertain the overall demand for therapy provision across special schools, and specialist provisions attached to mainstream schools for September 21 and beyond. Like what, how does that respond to the specific issues that were raised by parents? And Chair, just uh, during our briefings this morning, I'm not sure whether it was the Children's Law Centre or the, the Children's Commissioner mentioned the fact about the deficit in terms of uh, uh, therapies being available, uh, language therapy, occupational therapy, and so on. So, I mean, it's it's a very uh, unsatisfactory response, to say the least. Okay, and and, and Deputy Chair, final paragraph finishes. Whilst the education authority is making every effort to support where possible in this area, and the collaboration with health is extremely positive. It should be noted that ultimately the nature of the delivery of therapy services rests with the five health care trusts. So take it up with them, folks. What, what I page read, that, I read into that. What page is that? Sorry, I just lost the place. Page, uh, page 267. And 269. Yeah. And the, I mean, I mean that, 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 to me, that translates into we're doing all we can and ultimately take us up with the trusts. Yeah, that unfair and, reading that? No, and it, it, it adds to the point that I was making during the presentation about the issue of cross-departmental working and interagency collaboration uh, and, and the belief that there are a lot of difficulties when it comes to that. So, uh, I mean, the the are telling us, take it up with the health trust, you know. If, can, I, can I just come in there, Chair? Yeah, sure. And maybe before bringing in Robbie, I'll just say maybe I'm just at the end of a long meeting here or something. And, and obviously that we can raise this with the health trust. And, and maybe as the children's commissioner suggested, there are a number of issues that we need to engage with DEA and health and health trusts in a joint manner, and perhaps jointly with the health committee as well. But it is it is just slightly frustrating when parents have in my if my memory serves me correct, raised quite detailed issues in relation to therapy provision, you, you get that level of generality. Robbie, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. And the points are all very well made and, and just can't argue with any of them. I think this, this wraps up into the, the wider pressures uh, on health and education. And if you look at um, Minister Swong's uh, publication yesterday, and particularly the, the workforce, uh, the impact on workforce and what that plan looks like, for the next five years, if we're serious about meeting the needs of our young people, well then, guess what, guys? It comes down to political stability and the transformation of every single service that we have because they don't stand on their own. So I would imagine that, if, um, that whilst I totally agree with everything that's been said, we cannot look at this in isolation. 
um, the, the provision of services in the health sector, regardless of whether that's mental health, occupational health, regardless, guys, it doesn't stand in isolation. If there's no political stability, we're not serious about doing good government. We cannot beat any drum on this committee. So uh, I would just say that, uh, just to ask people to, to read everything in its entirety, happy to support any letter that goes back because our duty on this committee is for the young people and we need to be their voice. Happy with that, but we cannot do it in isolation of all the other things that are going on in Northern Ireland at the moment. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Political stability and, and proper decision making on, on some key issues. Um, but yeah, that's our collective responsibility. Okay. Um, Clark, can we um, I, I, maybe I, I'll review the original course, but members are content. I'll review the original correspondence to assess whether. Um, further actions required in that regard and I'm bring that back to the committee. I, I'm actually not sure what action to recommend in response to a correspondence of such generality. Um, if you're okay for me to review that original correspondence, to allow the clerk to move on. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've noted the action in the in the meantime um, that uh, we could schedule a, a briefing with EA and the Department of Health um, and we can update on that next week if there's anything additional. Um, yes. That's okay, thank you. So items 8, 13 through to 15 um, on pages 357, 364 and 369 um, are correspondents providing views from youth organisation on the department's response regarding the impact of COVID-19 on children and young people. Um, further responses are expected on this matter, members. So if you're content to note these Pending further reviews, we will collate them for you in advance of the committee's meeting on youth engagement on the 30th of June. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, some reports came in from Girl Guiding Ulster, as referred to last week, and also uh, there's a report from Home Start on Home is Where We Start From. Members, if you're interested in that, we could schedule an informal meeting with Home Start on the report in autumn. Great. Um, item 8.18 is correspondence on Kalinchi Primary School. Members, if you're content to note this, um, we can forward to, to the uh, correspondence the department's res response about the accountability of school governors. Great. Thank you. Item 8.21 on page 513 is corresponding asking if the committee intends to commission research into the health implications of children and young people wearing face masks. Um, the Health Committee has not um, done uh, research in that area um, and uh, it might be useful for the committee to write to education and health ministers asking for an up-to-date position on face masks in school and when that's likely to be reviewed. Happy with that, members content to agree that? Agreed. Okay. Um, item 822 on page 514 then is correspondence regarding the closure of Strayed Primary School. It's from a, a, a small business that had the opportunity to use the school premises. Um, so obviously that's an individual case members, but given what sorry, scouting... Sorry, 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 Chair. Go back to that previous correspondence. Is that just a COVID denier? We got a kid that jumps the tune of a COVID denier. But I don't, I don't think so, uh, Justin. I, th I think, you know, that I had a question to the minister, the former minister in the assembly recently, and, and he mentioned himself that um, there would be a, a, a review of the procedures relating to wearing face masks. I don't think, I, I think it's without prejudice to any position that we would ask what the what the current position is and, and whether there's any any review. Um, I, we, you know, I think this committee has supported all necessary measures that have been taken to ensure the safety of pupils and teachers in schools throughout the pandemic. I don't think we could ever be um, challenged in relation to that. And, and I don't think seeking an update in relation to the position or whether there's any scheduled review of that position deviates from that, that support for the, the health response that has been taken. Okay, sure. All right. Yeah. Hopefully, ask reassurance. Okay, thanks, Clark. Okay, so eight twenty two on page five one four. Then it's about the the closure of a primary school, and it's from a, a business owner who's who's been able to use the premises. So um, the committee won't want to get into the individual case, but um, given the, what scouting uh, the scouting organisation said last week about the pressure to have access to venues in light of social distancing um, and reopening. 
Um, I think it might be useful to write to the department and ask about the use of its uh, estate um, for community use. Uh, our members agreed? Agreed. Yep. Thank you. Um, and other than that, members, if you're content to dispose of the correspondence as per the summary note, um, we can move on to forward work programme. Okay. Can I, I just draw uh, members' attention, Clark, to the correspondence at 8.23, which is page 516. It's a, it's a fairly detailed response from the Education Authority on the, the role and responsibility of the Child Protection Support Service in the EA. Uh, again, that's something that I uh, will want to have a, a closer look at and I'll be bring back. But I just wanted to draw people's attention to that. And obviously, as well, 8.24 is information on the June monitoring round that members might wish to review in advance of our meeting with the on budget matters. Okay, thanks, thanks, Clark. Agenda item nine then is our forward work program. Um, can I? Sorry, yes. Agenda item nine or eight? Nine, Clark. <laughs> Apologies. Um, can I refer members to draft forward work program at page five four zero and seek committee's agreement to endorse the forward work program as amended. Clark, do you want to speak to any amendments first? Yeah, just that um, the committee um, wants to schedule a briefing um, with the new minister as soon as um, is, is possible for her. Um, also today agreed to schedule a, a briefing with the uh, Children's Commissioner um, and some further work on, um, on the UNCRC. So We'll add those in for you. Okay. Members content with the forward work program. We're obviously tightly scheduled um, to recess, but if members have suggestions for early September or, or any other engagements, I'm happy to do that. And if you, I'd ask you to note those informal sessions that we're um, scheduling for Tuesday mornings as well. Two suggestions, Chair. Dyslexia, dyslexia awareness. And I, uh, Joey Snowden, um, given the impacts one in ten, we should be having them in force. Uh, and also eating disorders, Nicola Adams, who uh, is beat eating disorders in the north here, very, very important work she's doing. It's, a, it's an issue that's not been um, discussed uh, prevalently enough and something we need to delve deeper into, especially in education. Young people need to be aware of that, the risks that are associated with that um, and the dangers and that understand it, essentially. Happy for those to be out of the schedule. Justin, members agree? Agree. Okay. Um, any other business members? Sure. Um, have you received any information with regard to um, the members that are moving off officially and so on, on off the committee and all? Just, just to recognise that. I, I. I don't know if I, if I have formally. I've, okay. I've received informal messaging during the meeting, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Right. Um, Just a matter of that, Mark, yeah. can, can, can you help us in that regard as to whether? Um, yeah, I was also yeah. checking it out during the meeting. So the business office has advised that the motion will be in the House on the 21st. Um, so it hasn't yes, happened Monday. yet. Um, yeah, Monday. So. Um, so are the, are there, are, there, are, there, are there members of the education committee who, who were with us today that won't be with us next Wednesday? Um, it actually does look like that, yeah, the transition okay. immediately. So it would be William and Morris being replaced by um, Harry Harvey and Diane Dobbs. Okay, well, I, I don't know if we're still um, on record or, or not, but um, I would obviously we'd, we'd like to thank uh, William Humphrey and Morris Bradley for their service to the Education Committee and perhaps we uh, members would agree that we write to them to um, to, to do so uh, and, and, and welcome the, the new members uh, on board as of next Wednesday, I presume then. Things can change fast in politics. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll be here next Wednesday, Chair. Hopefully we'll be here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other business members? Thank you, Chair. I mean, I, I, I'd say that in that manner, but I think a number of members uh, today and thankfully a number of our witnesses have agreed that having statutory committees, particularly the education committee in place, doing a job for children and young people and families in our education system in Northern Ireland is absolutely vital. 
Um, it's a privilege for all of us to serve here. I, I certainly think the absence of the accountability that committees provide during the period of executive collapse was, was devastating and has had devastating yeah. outcomes that we're working hard to try and reverse. So um, hopefully we will be able to continue the important job of work that we have. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Echo those. Okay, members, uh, next meeting next Wednesday, the 23rd of June at 9.30 a.m. via Starley. The committee meeting does now adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.